Section twenty three of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume two, Chapter one The Irrepressible Crocker. Hampstead remained nearly a fortnight down at Trafford, returning to Hendon only a few days before Christmas. Crocker, the post office clerk, came back to his duties at the same time, but, as was the custom with him, stole a day more than belonged to him, and thus incurred the frowns of Mr. Jerningham and the heavy wrath of the great Aeolus. The Aeoluses of the civil service are necessarily much exercised in their minds by such irregularities. To them, personally, it matters not at all whether one or another young man may be neglectful. It may be known to such a one that a crocker may be missed from his seat without any great injury, possibly with no injury at all, to the Queen's service. There are crockers whom it would be better to pay for their absence than their presence. This Aeolus thought it was so with this crocker. Then why not dismiss Crocker, and thus save the waste of public money? But there is a necessity, almost a necessity, that the Crockers of the world should live. They have mothers, or perhaps even wives, with backs to be clothed and stomachs to be fed, or perhaps with hearts to be broken. There is, at any rate, a dislike to proceed to the ultimate resort of what may be called the capital punishment of the civil service. To threaten, to frown, to scold, to make a young man's life a burden to him are all within the compass of an official Aeolus. You would think occasionally that such a one was resolved to turn half the clerks in his office out into the streets, so loud are the threats. In regard to individuals, he often is resolved to do so at the very next fault. But when the time comes, his heart misgives him. Even Aeolus is subject to mercy, and at last his conscience becomes so callous to his first imperative duty of protecting the public service that it grows to be a settled thing with him that though a man's life is to be made a burden to him, the man is not to be actually dismissed. But there are men to whom you cannot make their life a burden, men upon whom no frowns, no scoldings, no threats operate at all, and men unfortunately sharp enough to perceive what is that ultimate decision to which their Aeolus had been brought. Such a one was our Crocker, who cared very little for the blusterings, on this occasion he had remained away for the sake of having an additional day with the Brayside Harriers, and when he pleaded a bilious headache, no one believed him for an instant. It was in vain for Aeolus to tell him that a man subject to health so precarious was altogether unfitted for the civil service. Crocker had known beforehand exactly what was going to be said to him, and had discounted it at its exact worth. Even in the presence of Mr. Jerningham he spoke openly of the day's hunting, knowing that Mr. Jerningham would prefer his own ease to the trouble of renewed complaint. "'If you would sit at your desk now that you have come back, and go on with your docketing instead of making everybody else idle, it would be a great deal better.' said Mr. Jerningham. Then my horse took the wall and a fly, and old Amblethwaite crept over afterwards, continued Crocker, standing with his back to the fire, utterly disregarding Mr. Jerningham's admonitions. On his first entrance into the room, Crocker had shaken hands with Mr. Jerningham, then with Bobbin and Geraghty, and at last he came to Roden, with whom he would willingly have struck up terms of affectionate friendship had it been possible for him to do so. He had resolved that it should be so, but when the moment came his courage a little failed him. He had made himself very offensive to Roden at their last interview, and could see at a glance that Roden remembered it. 
as far as his own feelings were concerned such tiffs as he called them went for nothing he had indeed no feelings and was accustomed to say that he liked the system of give and take meaning that he liked being impudent to others and did not care how impudent others might be to him this toughness and insolence are as sharp as needles to others who do not possess the same gifts roden had learned to detest the presence of the young man to be sore when he was even spoken to and yet did not know how to put him down you may have a fierce bull to shut up you may muzzle a dog that will bite you may shoot a horse that you cannot cure of biting and tearing but you cannot bring yourself to spend a morning in hunting a bug or killing a flea crocker had made himself a serious annoyance even to lord hampstead though their presence together had only been for a very short time but roden had to pass his life at the same desk with the odious companion absolutely to cut him to let it be known all through the office that they two did not speak was to make too much of the matter but yet it was essentially necessary for his peace that some step should be taken to save himself from the man's insolence on the present occasion he nodded his head to crocker being careful not to lay the pen down from his fingers ain't you going to give us your hand old fellow said crocker putting on his best show of courage i don't know that i am said roden perhaps some of these days you may learn to make yourself less disagreeable i'm sure i always meant to be very friendly especially with you said crocker but it is so hard to get what one says taken in the proper sense after this not a word was spoken between the two all the morning this happened on a saturday saturday the twentieth of december on which day hampstead was to return to his own house punctually at one crocker left his desk and with a comic bow of mock courtesy to mr jerningham stuck his hat on the side of his head and left the office his mind as he took himself home to his lodgings was full of roden's demeanour towards him since he had become assured that his brother clerk was engaged to marry lady frances trafford he was quite determined to cultivate an enduring and affectionate friendship but what steps should he take to recover the ground which he had lost it occurred to him now that while he was in cumberland he had established quite an intimacy with lord hampstead and he thought that it would be well to use lord hampstead's acknowledged good nature for recovering the ground which he had lost with his brother clerk at about three o'clock that afternoon when lady frances was beginning to think that the time of her brother's arrival was near at hand the servant came into the drawing-room and told her that a gentleman had called and was desirous of seeing her what gentleman asked lady frances has he sent his name no my lady but he says he says that he is a clerk from the post office lady frances was at the moment so dismayed that she did not know what answer to give there could be but one post office clerk who should be anxious to see her and she had felt from the tone of the servant's voice that he had known that it was her lover who had called everybody knew that the post office clerk was her lover some immediate answer was necessary she quite understood the pledge that her brother had made on her behalf and though she had not made herself any actual promise she felt that she was bound not to receive george roden but yet she could not bring herself to turn him away from the door and so to let the servant suppose that she was ashamed to see him to whom she had given the promise of her hand you had better show the gentleman in she said at last with a voice that almost trembled a moment afterwards the door was opened and mr crocker entered the room she had endeavoured in the minute which had been allowed her to study the manner in which she should receive her lover 
as she heard the approaching footsteps, she prepared herself. She had just risen from her seat, nearly risen, when the strange man appeared. It has to be acknowledged that she was grievously disappointed, although she had told herself that Roden ought not to have come to her. What woman is there will not forgive her lover for coming, even though he certainly should not have come? What woman is there will fail to receive a stranger with hard looks, when a stranger shall appear to her instead of an expected lover? Sir, she said, standing as he walked up the room and made a low bow to her, as he took his position before her. Crocker was dressed up to the eyes and wore yellow kid gloves. Lady Frances, he said, I am Mr. Crocker, Mr. Samuel Crocker of the General Post Office. You may not perhaps have heard of me from my friend Mr. Roden? No, indeed, sir. You might have done so, as we sit in the same room and at the same desk. Or you may remember meeting me at dinner at your uncle's castle in Cumberland. Is anything, anything the matter with Mr. Roden? Not in the least, my lady. I had the pleasure of leaving him in very good health about two hours since. There is nothing at all to occasion your ladyship the slightest uneasiness. A dark frown came across her brow as she heard the man talk thus freely of her interest in George Roden's condition. She no doubt had betrayed her own secret as far as there was a secret, but she was not on that account the less angry because he had forced her to do so. "'Has Mr. Roden sent you as a messenger?' she asked. "'No, my lady, no. That would not be at all probable. I am sure he would very much rather come with any message of his own.' At this he sniggered most offensively. I called with a hope of seeing your brother, Lord Hampstead, with whom I may take the liberty of saying that I have a slight acquaintance. Lord Hampstead is not at home. So the servant told me. Then it occurred to me that, as I had come all the way down from London, for a certain purpose, to ask a little favor from his lordship, and as I was not fortunate enough to find his lordship at home, I might ask the same from your ladyship. There can be nothing that I can do for you, sir. You can do it, my lady, much better than anyone else in the world. You can be more powerful in this matter even than his lordship. What can it be? asked Lady Frances. If your ladyship will allow me, I will sit down, as the story I have to tell is somewhat particular. It was impossible to refuse him the use of a chair, and she could therefore only bow as he seated himself. I and George Roden, my lady, have known each other intimately for these ever so many years. Again she bowed her head. And I may say that we used to be quite pals. When two men sit at the same desk together, they ought to be thick as thieves. See what a cat-and-dog life it is, else. Don't you think so, my lady? I know nothing of office life. As I don't think that I can help you, perhaps you wouldn't mind going away? Oh, my lady, you must hear me to the end, because you are just the person who can help me. Of course, as you two are situated, he would do anything you were to bid him. Now he has taken it into his head to be very huffy with me. Indeed, I can do nothing in the matter, she said, in a tone of deep distress. If you would only just tell him that I have never meant to offend him, I am sure I don't know what it is that has come up. It may be that I said a word in joke about Lord Hampstead, only that there really could not have been anything in that. Nobody could have a more profound respect for his lordship's qualities than I have, and I may say the same for your ladyship most sincerely. I have always thought it a great feather in Roden's cap that he should be so closely connected, more than closely, I may say, with your noble family. 
What on earth was she to do with a man who would go on talking to her, making at every moment insolent allusions to the most cherished secret of her heart? "'I must beg you to go away and leave me, sir,' she said. "'My brother will be here almost immediately.' This had escaped from her with a vain idea that the man would receive it as a threat, that he would think probably that her brother would turn him out of the house for his insolence. In this she was altogether mistaken. He had no idea that he was insolent. "'Then perhaps you will allow me to wait for his lordship?' he said. "'Oh, dear, no. He may come, or he may not. You really cannot wait.' you ought not to have come at all. But for the sake of peace, my lady, one word from your fair lips. Lady Frances could endure it no longer. She got up from her seat and walked out of the room, leaving Mr. Crocker planted in his chair. In the hall she found one of the servants, whom she told to take that man to the front door at once. The servant did as he was bid, and Crocker was ushered out of the house without any feeling on his part that he had misbehaved himself. Crocker had hardly got beyond the grounds when Hampstead did in truth return. The first words spoken between him and his sister, of course, referred to their father's health. "'He is unhappy rather than ill,' said Hampstead. "'Is it about me?' she asked. No, not at all about you in the first instance. What does that mean? It is not because of you, but from what others say about you. Mamma? she asked. Yes, and Mr. Greenwood. Does he interfere? I am afraid he does, not directly with my father, but through her ladyship who daily tells my father what the stupid old man says. Lady Kingsbury is most irrational and harassing. I have always thought her to be silly, but now I cannot keep myself from feeling that she misbehaves herself grievously. She does everything she can to add to his annoyance. That is very bad. It is bad. He can turn Mr. Greenwood out of the house if Mr. Greenwood becomes unbearable, but he cannot turn his wife out. Could he not come here? I am afraid not, without bringing her too. She has taken it into her stupid head that you and I are disgracing the family. As for me, she seems to think that I am actually robbing her own boys of their rights. I would do anything for them, or even for her, if I could comfort her, but she is determined to look upon us as enemies. My father says that it will worry him into his grave. Poor papa! We can run away, but he cannot. I became very angry when I was there, both with her ladyship and that pestilential old clergyman, and told them both pretty much what I thought. I have the comfort of knowing that I have two bitter enemies in the house. Can they hurt you? Not in the least, except in this, that they can teach those little boys to regard me as an enemy. I would fain have had my brothers left to me. Mr. Greenwood, and I must now say her ladyship, also, are nothing to me. It was not till after dinner that the story was told about Crocker. Think what I must have felt when I was told that a clerk from the post office wanted to see me. And then that brute Crocker was shown in? asked Hampstead. Do you really know him? Know him? I should rather think so. Don't you remember him at Castle Hoboy? Not in the least. But he told me that he had been there. He never would leave me. He absolutely drove me out of the country because he would follow me about when we were hunting. He insulted me so grievously that I had to turn tail and run away from him. What did he want of me? To intercede for him with George Roden. 
He is an abominable man, irrepressible, so thick-skinned that you cannot possibly get at him so as to hurt him. It is of no use telling him to keep his distance, for he does not in the least know what you mean. I do not doubt that he has left the house with a conviction that he has gained a sincere friend in you. It was now more than a fortnight since Mary and Fay had dined at Hendon, and Hampstead felt that, unless he could succeed in carrying on the attack which he had commenced, any little beginning of a friendship which he had made with the Quaker would be obliterated by the length of time. If she thought about him at all, she must think that he was very indifferent to let so long a time pass by without any struggle on his part to see her again. There had been no word of love spoken, he had been sure of that, but still there had been something of affectionate intercourse which she could not have failed to recognize. What must she think of him if he allowed that to pass away without any renewal, without an attempt at carrying it further? When she had bade him to go in out of the cold, there had been something in her voice which had made him feel that she was in truth anxious for him. Now more than a fortnight had gone, and there had been no renewal. Fanny, he said, how would it be if we were to ask those Quakers to dine here on Christmas Day? It would be odd, wouldn't it, as they are strangers and dined here so lately? People like that do not stand on ceremony at all. I don't see why they shouldn't come. I could say that you want to make their acquaintance. Would you ask them alone? In that he felt that the great difficulty lay. The Fays would hardly come without Mrs. Roden, and the Rodens could not be asked. One doesn't always ask the same people to meet each other. It would be very odd, and I don't think they'd come, said Lady Frances, gravely. Then, after a pause, she went on, I fear, John, that there is more in it than mere dinner company. Certainly there is, he said boldly, much more in it. You are not in love with the Quaker's daughter. I rather think I am. When I have seen her three or four times more, I shall be able to find out. You may be sure of this, that I mean to see her three or four times more, and at any rate one of the times must be before I go down to Gorse Hall. Then, of course, she knew the whole truth. He did, however, give up the idea as to the Christmas dinner party, having arrived at the belief, after turning the matter over in his mind, that Zachary Fay would not bring his daughter again so soon. End of section 23 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 24 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 2 Mrs. Roden's Eloquence on Sunday, Hampstead was nervous and fidgety. He had at one time thought that it would be the very day for him to go to Holloway. He would be sure to find Mrs. Roden at home after church, and then, if he could carry things to the necessary length, he might also see Zachary Fay. But on consideration, it appeared to him that Sunday would not suit his purpose. George Roden would be there, and would be sadly in the way. And the Quaker himself would be in the way, as it would be necessary that he should have some preliminary interview with Marion before anything could be serviceably said to her father. He was driven, therefore, to postpone his visit. Nor would Monday do, as he knew enough of the manners of Paradise Road to be aware that on Monday Mrs. Vincent would certainly be there. It would be his object, if things could be made to go pleasantly, first to see Mrs. Roden for a few minutes, and then to spend as much of the afternoon as might be possible with Marion Fay. 
he therefore fixed on the tuesday for his purpose and having telegraphed about the country for his horses groom and other appurtenances he went down to leighton on the monday and consoled himself with a day's hunting with the staghounds on his return his sister spoke to him very seriously as to her own affairs is not this almost silly john about mr roden not coming here not silly at all according to my ideas all the world knows that we are engaged the very servants have heard of it that horrid young man who came from the post office was aware of it what has all that to do with it if it has been made public in that way what can be the object of keeping us apart mamma no doubt told her sister and lady persiflage has published it everywhere her daughter is going to marry a duke and it has crowned her triumph to let it be known that i am going to marry only a post-office clerk i don't begrudge her that in the least but as they have talked about it so much they ought at any rate to let me have my post-office clerk i have nothing to say about it one way or the other said hampstead i say nothing about it at any rate now what do you mean by that john when i saw how miserable you were at trafford i did my best to bring you away but i could only bring you here on an express stipulation that you should not meet george roden while you were in my house if you can get my father's consent to your meeting him then that part of the contract will be over i don't think i made any promise i understand it so i said nothing to papa on the subject and i do not remember that i made any promise to you i am sure i did not i promised for you to this she was silent are you going to ask him to come here certainly not but if he did come how could i refuse to see him i thought that he was here on saturday and i told richard to admit him i could not send him away from the door i do not think he will come unless he is asked said hampstead then the conversation was over on the following day at two o'clock lord hampstead again started for holloway on this occasion he drove over and left his trap and servant at the duchess of edinburgh he was so well known in the neighborhood now as hardly to be able to hope to enter on the domains of paradise row without being recognized he felt that it was hard that his motions should be watched telling himself that it was one of the evils belonging to an hereditary nobility. But he must accept this mischief as he did others, and he walked up the street, trying to look as though he didn't know that his motions were being watched, first from number 15 as he passed it, and then from number 10 opposite as he stood at Mrs. Roden's door mrs roden was at home and received him of course with her most gracious smile but her heart sank within her as she saw him for she felt sure that he had come in pursuit of marion fay it is very kind of you to call she said i had heard from george that you had gone down into the country since we had the pleasure of dining with you yes my father has been unwell and i had to stay with him a few days or i should have been here sooner you got home all of you quite well oh yes miss fay did not catch cold not at all though i fear she is hardly strong she is not ill i hope oh no not that but she lives here very quietly and i doubt whether the excitement of going out is good for her there was not much excitement at hendon hall i think he said laughing not for you but for her perhaps in appreciating our own condition we are so apt to forget what is the condition of others 
To marry and Fay it was a strange event to have to dine at your house, and strange also to receive little courtesies such as yours. It is hard for you to conceive how strongly the nature of such a girl may be affected by novelties. I have almost regretted, Lord Hampstead, that I should have consented to take her there. Has she said anything? Oh, no, there was nothing for her to say. You are not to suppose that any harm has been done. What harm could have been done? he asked. Of what nature was the harm of which Mrs. Roden was speaking? Could it be that Marian had made any sign of altered feelings, had declared in any way her liking or disliking, had given outward testimony of thoughts which would have been pleasant to him, or perhaps unpleasant, had he known them? No harm, of course, said Mrs. Roden, only to a nature such as hers all excitement is evil. I cannot believe that, he said, after a pause. Now and then in the lives of all of us there must come moments of excitement which cannot be all evil. What would Marion say if I were to tell her that I loved her? I hope you will not do that, my lord. Why should you hope so? What right have you to hope so? If I do love her, is it not proper that I should tell her? but it would not be proper that you should love her. There, Mrs. Roden, I take the liberty of declaring that you are altogether in the wrong, and that you speak without due consideration. Do I, my lord? I think so. Why am I not to be allowed the ordinary privilege of a man, that of declaring my passion to a woman when I meet one who seems in all things to fulfill the image of perfection which I have formed for myself when I see a girl that I fancy I can love. Ah, there is the worst. It is only a fancy. I will not be accused in that way without defending myself. Let it be fancy or what not. I love Mary and Fay, and I have come here to tell her so. If I can make any impression on her, I shall come again and tell her father so. I am here now because I think that you can help me. If you will not, I shall go on without your help. What can I do? Go to her with me now, at once. You say that excitement is bad for her. The excitement will be less if you will come with me to her house. Then there was a long pause in the conversation, during which Mrs. Roden was endeavouring to determine what might be her duty at this moment. She certainly did not think that it would be well that Lord Hampstead, the eldest son of the Marquis of Kingsbury, should marry Marion Fay. She was quite sure that she had all the world with her there. Were anyone to know that she had assisted in arranging such a marriage, that any one would certainly condemn her. That would assuredly be the case, not only with the young lord's family, not only with others of the young lord's order, but with all the educated world of Great Britain. How could it be that such a one as Marion Fay should be a fitting wife for such a one as Lord Hampstead? Marion Fay had undoubtedly great gifts of her own, she was beautiful, intelligent, sweet-minded, and possessed of natural delicacy, so much so that, to Mrs. Roden herself, she had become as dear almost as a daughter. But it was impossible that she should have either the education or the manners fit for the wife of a great English peer. Though her manners might be good and her education excellent, they were not those required for that special position. And then there was cause for other fears. Marion's mother and brothers and sisters had all died young. The girl herself had hitherto seemed to escape the scourge under which they perished. But occasionally there would rise to her cheeks a bright color, which for the moment would cause Mrs. Roden's heart to sink within her. Occasionally there would be heard from her not a cough, but that little preparation for coughing, 
which has become so painfully familiar to the ears of those whose fate it has been to see their beloved ones gradually fade from presumed health she had already found herself constrained to say a word or two to the old quaker not telling him that she feared any coming evil but hinting that change of air would certainly be beneficial to such a one as marian acting under this impulse he had taken her during the inclemency of the past spring to the isle of wight she was minded gradually to go on with this counsel so as if possible to induce the father to send his girl out of london for some considerable portion of the year if this were so how could she possibly encourage lord hampstead in his desire to make marion his wife and then as to the girl herself could it be for her happiness that she should be thus lifted into a strange world a world that would be hard and ungracious to her and in which it might be only too probable that the young lord should see her defects when it would be too late for either of them to remedy the evil that had been done she had thought something of all this before having recognized the possibility of such a step as this after what she had seen at hendon hall she had told herself that it would be well at any rate to discourage any such idea in marian's heart and had spoken jokingly of the gallantry of men of rank marian had smiled sweetly as she had listened to her friend's words and had at once said that such manners were at any rate pretty and becoming in one so placed as lord hampstead there had been something in this to make mrs roden almost fear that her words had been taken as intending too much that marian had accepted them as a caution against danger not for worlds would she have induced the girl to think that any danger was apprehended but now the danger had come and it behoved mrs roden if possible to prevent the evil will you come across with me now said hampstead having sat silent in his chair while these thoughts were passing through the lady's mind i think not my lord why not mrs roden will it not be better than that i should go alone i hope you will not go at all i shall go certainly i consider myself bound by all laws of honesty to tell her what she has done to me she can then judge what may be best for herself do not go at any rate to-day lord hampstead let me beg at least as much as that of you consider the importance of the step you will be taking i have thought of it said he marion is as good as gold i know she is marion i say is as good as gold but is it likely that any girl should remain untouched and undazzled by such an offer as you can make her touched i hope she may be as for dazzled i do not believe in it in the least there are eyes which no false lights can dazzle but if she were touched as would no doubt be the case said mrs roden could it be well that you with such duties before you should marry the daughter of zachary fay listen to me a moment she continued as he attempted to interrupt her i know what you would say and i sympathize with much of it but it cannot be well for society that classes should be mixed together suddenly and roughly what roughness would there be he asked as lords and ladies are at present as dukes are and duchesses and such like there would be a roughness to them in having mary and fay presented to them as one of themselves lords have married low-born girls i know and the wives have been contented with a position which has almost been denied to them or only grudgingly accorded i have known something of that my lord and have felt at any rate i have seen its bitterness marian fay would fade and sink to nothing if she were subjected to such contumely to be marian fay is enough for her to be your wife and not to be thought fit to be your wife would not be half enough 
she shall be thought fit. You can make her Lady Hampstead, and demand that she shall be received at court. You can deck her with diamonds, and cause her to be seated high in honor, according to your own rank. But could you induce your father's wife to smile on her? In answer to this he was dumb. Do you think she would be contented if your father's wife were to frown on her? My father's wife is not everybody. She would necessarily be much to your wife. Take a week, my lord, or a month, and think upon it. She expects nothing from you yet, and it is still in your power to save her from unhappiness. I would make her happy, Mrs. Roden. Think about it, think about it and I would make myself happy also. You count my feelings as being nothing in the matter. Nothing as compared with hers. You see how plainly I deal with you. Let me say that, for a time, your heart will be sore, that you do in truth love this girl so as to feel that she is necessary to your happiness. Do you not know that if she were placed beyond your reach you would recover from that sting? the duties of the world would still be open to you. Being a man, you would still have before you many years for recovery, before your youth had departed from you. Of course you would find some other woman and be happy with her. For her, if she came to shipwreck in this venture, there would be no other chance. I would make this chance enough for her. So you think, but if you will look abroad, you will see that the perils to her happiness which I have attempted to describe are not vain. I can say no more, my lord, but can only beg that you will take some little time to think of it before you put the thing out of your own reach. As she had once accepted your love, I know that you would never go back. Never. Therefore think again while there is time. He slowly dragged himself up from his chair, and left her almost without a word at parting. She had persuaded him to take another week. It was not that he doubted in the least his own purpose, but he did not know how to gainsay her as to this small request. In that frame of mind which is common to young men, when they do not get all that they want, Angry, disappointed, and foiled, he went downstairs and opened the front door, and there on the very steps he met Marion Fay. Marion, he said, pouring all the tenderness of his heart into his voice. My lord? Come in, Marion, for one moment. Then she followed him into the little passage, and there they stood. I had come over to ask you how you are after our little party. I am quite well. And you? I have been away with my father, or I should have come sooner. Nay, it was not necessary that you should trouble yourself. It is necessary. It is necessary, or I should be troubled very much. I am troubled. She stood there looking down on the ground as though she were biding her time, but she did not speak to him. She would not come with me, he said, pointing up the stairs on which Mrs. Roden was now standing. She has told me that it is bad that I should come, but I will come one day soon. He was almost beside himself with love as he was speaking. The girl was so completely after his own heart as he stood there close to her, filled with her influences, that he was unable to restrain himself. "'Come up, Marion, dear,' said Mrs. Roden, speaking from the landing. "'It is hardly fair to keep Lord Hampstead standing in the passage.' "'It is most unfair,' said Marion. "'Good day, my lord.' "'I will stand here till you come down to me, unless you will speak to me again.' I will not be turned out while you are here. Marion, you are all the world to me. I love you with my whole, whole heart. I had come here, dear, to tell you so, but she has delayed me. 
she made me promise that i would not come again for a week as though weeks or years could change me say one word to me marion one word shall suffice now and then i will go marion can you love me come to me marion come to me said mrs roden do not answer him now no said marion looking up and laying her hand gently on the sleeve of his coat i will not answer him now it is too sudden i must think of words to answer such a speech lord hampstead i will go to her now but i shall hear from you you shall come to me again and i will tell you to-morrow nay but give me a day or two on friday i will be ready with my answer you will give me your hand marion she gave it to him and he covered it with kisses only have this in your mind fixed as fate that no man ever loved a woman more truly than i love you no man was ever more determined to carry out his purpose i am in your hands think if you cannot dare to trust yourself into mine then he left her and went back to the duchess of edinburgh not thinking much of the eyes which might be looking at him end of section twenty four recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina Section 25 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 3 Marion's Views About Marriage. When Lord Hampstead shut the door behind him, Marion went slowly up the stairs to Mrs. Roden, who had returned to her drawing room. When she entered, her friend was standing near the door, with anxiety plainly written on her face, with almost more than anxiety. She took Marion by the hand and, kissing her, led her to the sofa. "'I would have stopped him if I could,' she said. "'Why should you have stopped him? Such things should be considered more.' He had made it too late for considering to be of service. I knew, I almost knew, that he would come. You did? I can tell myself now that I did, though I could not say it even to myself before. There was a smile on her face as she spoke, and though her color was heightened, there was none of that peculiar flush which Mrs. Roden so greatly feared to see nor was there any special excitement in her manner. There was no look either of awe or of triumph. She seemed to take it as a matter of course, quite as much at least as any Lady Amaldina could have done, who might have been justified by her position in expecting that some young noble eldest son would fling himself at her feet. "'And are you ready with your answer?' Marion turned her eyes towards her friend, but made no immediate reply. "'My darling girl, for you are in truth very dear to me, much thought should be given to such an appeal as that before any answer is made.' "'I have thought. And are you ready?' "'I think so. Dear Mrs. Roden, do not look at me like that. If I do not say more to tell you immediately, it is because I am not perhaps quite sure, not sure at any rate of the reasons I may have to give. I will come to you to-morrow, and then I will tell you. There was room then at any rate for hope. If the girl had not quite resolved to grasp at the high destiny offered to her, it was still her friend's duty to say something that might influence her. Marion, dear, say all that you think, Mrs. Roden. Surely you know that I know that whatever may come from you will come from love. I have no mother, and to whom can I go better than to you to fill a mother's place? Dear Marion, it is thus I feel towards you. 
what i would say to you i would say to my own child there are great differences in the ranks of men i have felt that and though i do in my honest belief think that the best and honestest of god's creatures are not always to be found among so-called nobles yet i think that a certain great respect should be paid to those whom chance has raised to high places do i not respect him i hope so but perhaps you may not show it best by loving him as to that it is a matter in which one can perhaps hardly control oneself if asked for love it will come from you like water from a fountain unless it be so then it cannot come at all that surely is a dangerous doctrine for a young woman young women i think are compassed by many dangers said marion and i know but one way of meeting them what way is that dear i will tell you if i can find how to tell it to-morrow there is one point marion on which i feel myself bound to warn you as i endeavoured also to warn him to him my words seem to have availed nothing but to you i think are more reasonable unequal marriages never make happy either the one side or the other i hope i may do nothing to make him unhappy unhappy for a moment you must make him for a month perhaps or for a year though it were for years what would that be to his whole life for years said marion no not for years would it be more than for days do you think i cannot tell what may be the nature of the young man's heart nor can you but as to that it cannot be your duty to take much thought of his lasting welfare you are bound to think oh yes of that certainly of that above all things i mean as to this world of what may come afterwards to one so little known we here can hardly dare to speak or even to think but a girl when she has been asked to marry a man is bound to think of his welfare in this life i cannot but think of his eternal welfare also said marion unequal marriages are always unhappy said mrs roden repeating her great argument always i fear so could you be happy if his great friends his father and his stepmother and all those high-born lords and ladies who are connected with him could you be happy if they frowned on you what would their frowns be to me if he smiled i should be happy if the world were light and bright to him it would certainly be light and bright to me i thought so once marion i argued with myself once just as you are arguing now nay mrs roden i am hardly arguing it was just so that i spoke to myself saying that the joy which i took in a man's love would certainly be enough for my happiness but oh alas i fell to the ground i will tell you now more of myself than i have told any one for many a year more even than i have told george i will tell you because i know that i can trust your faith yes you can trust me said marion i also married greatly greatly as the world's honors are concerned in mere rank i stood as a girl higher perhaps than you do now but i was lifted out of my own degree and in accepting the name which my husband gave me i assured myself that i would do honour to it at any rate by my conduct i did it no dishonour but my marriage was most unfortunate was he good asked marion he was weak are you sure that lord hampstead is strong he was fickle-hearted can you be sure that lord hampstead will be constant amidst the charms of others whose manners will be more like his own than yours can be i think he would be constant 
said Marion. Because you are ready to worship him who has condescended to step down from his high pedestal and worship you. Is it not so? It may be that it is so, said Marion. Ah, yes, my child, it may be that it is so. And then think of what may follow. Not only for him, but for you also. Not only for you, but for him also. Broken hearts, crushed ambitions, hopes all dead, personal dislikes, and perhaps hatred. Not hatred, not hatred. I live to be hated, and why not another? Then she was silent, and Marion, rising from her seat, kissed her and went away to her home. She had very much to think of though she had declared that she had almost expected this offer from her lover, still it could not be that the Quaker girl, the daughter of Zachary Fay, Messrs. Pogson and Littlebird's clerk, should not be astounded by having such an offer from such a suitor as Lord Hampstead. But in truth the glory of the thing was not very much to her. It was something, no doubt, it must be something to a girl to find that her own personal charms have sufficed to lure down from his lofty perch the topmost bird of them all. That Marion was open to some such weakness may be acknowledged of her, but of the coronet, of the diamonds, of the lofty title and high seats, of the castle and the parks and well-arranged equipages, of the rich dresses, of the obsequious servants and fawning world that would be gathered around her, it may be said that she thought not at all. She had in her short life seen one man who had pleased her ear and her eye, and had touched her heart, and that one man had instantly declared himself to be all her own. That made her bosom glow with some feeling of triumph. That same evening she abruptly told the whole story to her father. Father, she said, Lord Hampstead was here today. Here, in this house? Not in this house, but I met him at our friends, whom I went to see, as is my custom, almost daily. I am glad he came not here, said the Quaker. Why should you be glad? To this the Quaker made no answer. His purpose was to have come here. It was to see me that he came. To see thee? Father, the young lord has asked me to be his wife. Asked thee to be his wife? Yes, indeed. Have you not often heard that young men may be infatuated? It has chanced that I have been the Cinderella for his eyes. But thou art no princess, child. And therefore am unfit to mate with this prince. I could not answer him at once, father. It was too sudden for me to find the words, and the place was hardly fitting, but I have found them now. What words, my child? I will tell him with all respect and deference. Nay, I will tell him with some love, for I do love him, that it will become him to look for his wife elsewhere. Marion, said the Quaker, who was somewhat moved by those things which had altogether failed with the girl herself, Marion, must it be so? Father, it must certainly be so. And yet thou lovest him? Though I were dying for his love, it must be so. Why, my child, why? As far as I saw the young man, he is good and gracious, of great promise, and like to be true-hearted. Good and gracious and true-hearted? Oh, yes. And would you have it that I should bring such a one as that to sorrow, perhaps to disgrace? Why to sorrow? Why to disgrace? Wouldst thou be more likely to disgrace a husband than one of those painted Jezebels who know no worship but that of their faded beauty? 
Thou hast not answered him, Marion. No, father. He is to come on Friday for my answer. Think of it yet again, my child. Three days are no time for considering a matter of such moment. Bid him leave you for ten days further. I am ready now, said Marion. And yet thou lovest him? That is not true to nature, Marion. I would not bid thee take a man's hand because he is rich and great, if thou couldst not give him thy heart in return. I would not have thee break any law of God or man for the glitter of gold or tinsel of rank. But the good things of this world, if they be come by honestly, are good. And the love of an honest man, if thou lovest him thyself in return, is not of the less worth because he stands high in wealth and in honor. Shall I think nothing of him, father? Yea, verily, it will be thy duty to think of him, almost exclusively of him, when thou shalt be his wife. Then, father, shall I never think of him. Wilt thou pay no heed to my words, so as to crave from him further time for thought? Not for a moment. Father, you must not be angry with your child for this. My own feelings tell me true. My own heart, and my own heart alone, can dictate to me what I shall say to him. There are reasons. What reasons? There are reasons why my mother's daughter should not marry this man. Then there came a cloud across his brow, and he looked at her as though almost over, almost overcome by his anger. It seemed as though he strove to speak, but he sat for a while in silence. Then, rising from his chair, he left the room, and did not see her again that night. This was on a Tuesday. On the Wednesday he did not speak to her on the subject. The Thursday was Christmas Day and she went to church with Mrs. Roden. Nor did he on that day allude to the matter, but on the evening she made to him a little request. Tomorrow, father, is a holiday, is it not, in the city? So they tell me. I hate such tomfooleries. When I was young, a man might be allowed to earn his bread on all lawful days of the week. Now he is expected to spend the wages he cannot earn in drinking and shows. Father, you must leave me here alone after our dinner. He will come for his answer. And you will give it? Certainly, father, certainly. Do not question me further, for it must be as I told you. Then he left her as he had done before but he did not urge her with any repetition of his request. This was what occurred between Marion and her father, but on the Wednesday she had gone to Mrs. Roden, as she had promised, and there explained her purpose more fully than she had before been able to do. "'I have come, you see,' she said, smiling. "'I might have told you all at once,' for I have changed nothing of my mind since first he spoke to me all so suddenly in the passage downstairs. Are you so sure of yourself? Quite sure, quite sure. Do you think I would hurt him? No, no, you would not, I know, do so willingly. And yet I must hurt him a little. I hope it will hurt him just a little. Mrs. Roden stared at her. Oh, if I could make him understand it all, if I could bid him to be a man, so that it should wound him only for a short time. What wound? Did you think that I could take him, I, the daughter of a city clerk, to go and sit in his halls and shame him before all the world, because he had thought fit to make me his wife? Never! Marion, Marion, because he has made a mistake which has honored me, shall I mistake also, so as to dishonor him? Because he has not seen the distance, shall I be blind to it? He would have given himself up for me. Shall I not be able to make a sacrifice? 
to such a one as i am to sacrifice myself is all that i can do in the world is it such a sacrifice could it be that i should not love him when such a one comes casting his pearls about throwing sweet odors through the air whispering words which are soft sounding as music in the heavens whispering them to me casting them at me turning on me the laughing glances of his young eyes how could i help to love him do you remember when for a moment he knelt almost at my feet and told me that i was his friend and spoke to me of his hearth do you think that that did not move me so soon my child so soon in a moment is it not so that it is done always hearts are harder than that marion mine i think was so soft just then that the half of his sweet things would have ravished it from my bosom but i feel for myself that there are two parts in me though the one can melt away and pass altogether from my control can gush like water that runs out and cannot be checked the other has something in it of hard substance which can stand against blows even from him what is that something marion nay i cannot name it i think it be another heart of finer substance or it may be it is woman's pride which will suffer all things rather than hurt the one it loves i know myself no words from him no desire to see his joy as he would be joyful if i told him that i could give him all he asks no longing for all his love could do for me shall move me one tittle he shall tell himself to his dying day that the quaker girl because she loved him was true to his interests my child my child said mrs roden taking marion in her arms do you think that i do not know that i have forgotten was it nothing to me to see my mother die and her little ones do i not know that i am not as others are free to wed not a lord like that but even one of my own standing mrs roden if i can live till my poor father shall have gone before me so that he may not be left alone when the weakness of age shall have come upon him then then i shall be satisfied to follow them no dream of loving had ever crossed my mind he has come and without my mind the dream has been dreamed i think that my lot will be happier so than if i had passed away without any feeling such as that i have now perhaps he will not marry till i am gone would that hurt you so sorely it ought not it shall not it will be well that he should marry and i will not wish to cause him evil he will have gone away and i shall hardly know of it perhaps they will not tell me Mrs. Roden could only embrace her, sobbing, wiping her eyes with piteousness. But I will not begrudge aught of the sacrifice, she continued. There is nothing, I think, sweeter than to deny oneself all things for love. What are our lessons for but to teach us that? Shall I not do unto him as it would be well for me that some such girl should do for my sake, if I were such as he? oh marion you have got the better part and yet and yet i would that he should feel a little because he cannot have the toy that has pleased his eye what was it that he saw in me do you think as she asked the question she cheered up wonderfully the beauty of your brow and eyes the softness of your woman's voice nay but i think it was my quaker dress his eye perhaps likes things all of a color i had too new gloves and a new frock when he saw me how well i remember his coming how he would glance round at me till i hardly knew whether i was glad that he should observe me so much or offended at his persistence 
I think that I was glad, though I told myself that he should not have glanced at me so often. And then, when he asked us to go down to his house, I did long, I did long, to win father's consent to the journey, had he not gone. Do not think of it, Marion. That I will not promise, but I will not talk of it. Now, dear Mrs. Roden, let all then be as though it had never been. I do not mean to mope or to neglect my work, because a young lord has crossed my path and told me that he loves me. I must send him from me, and then I will be just as I have always been. Having made this promise, she went away, leaving Mrs. Roden much more flurried by the interview than was she herself. When the Friday came, holiday as it was, the Quaker took himself off to the city after dinner, without another word as to his daughter's lover. End of section 25 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 26 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 4 Lord Hampstead is Impatient Hampstead, when he was sent away from Paradise Row and bade to wait till Friday for an answer, was disappointed, almost cross, and unreasonable in his feeling towards Mrs. Roden. To Mrs. Roden altogether he attributed it that Marion had deferred her reply. Whether the delay thus enjoined told well or ill for his hopes, he could not bring himself to determine. As he drove himself home, his mind was swayed now in one direction and now in the other. Unless she loved him somewhat, unless she thought it possible that she should love him, she would hardly have asked for time to think of it all. And yet, had she really have loved him, why should she have asked for time? He had done for her all that a man could do for a girl, and if she loved him she should not have tormented him by foolish delays, by coying her love. It should be said on his behalf that he attributed to himself no preponderance of excellence either on the score of his money or his rank. He was able so to honor the girl as to think of her that such things would go for nothing with her. It was not that he had put his coronet at her feet, but his heart. It was of that he thought when he reminded himself of all that he had done for her, and told himself angrily that she should not have tormented him. He was as arrogant and impatient of disappointment as any young lord of them all. But it was not, however, because he was a lord that he thought that Marion's heart was due to him. I have been over to Holloway, he said to his sister, almost as soon as he had returned. Out of the full heart the mouth speaks. Have you seen George? asked Lady Frances. No. I did not go to see him. He, of course, would be at his office during the day. I went about my own business. You need not be so savage with me, John. What was your own business at Holloway? I went to ask Marion Fay to be my wife. You did? Yes, I did. Why should I not? It seems the fashion for us all now to marry just those we fancy best. And why not? Have I gainsaid you? If this Quaker's daughter be good and honest and fair to look at? That she is fair to look at I can say certainly. That she is good I believe thoroughly. That she is honest at any rate to me I cannot say as yet. Not honest? She will not steal or pick a pocket, if you mean that. What is it, John? Why do you speak of her in this way? Because I have chosen to tell you. Having made up my mind to do this thing, I would not keep it secret as though I were ashamed of it. 
how can i say that she is honest till she has answered me honestly what answer has she made you she asked none as yet she has told me to come again another day i like her better for that why should you like her better just because you're a woman and think that shilly-shallying and pretending not to know your own mind and keeping a fellow in suspense is becoming i am not going to change my mind about marion but i do think that mock hesitation is unnecessary and in some degree dishonest must it necessarily be mock hesitation ought she not to be sure of herself that she can love you certainly or that she should not love me i am not such a puppy as to suppose she is to throw herself into my arms just because i ask her but i think that she must have known something of herself so as to have been able to tell me either to hope or not to hope she was as calm as a minister in the house of commons answering a question and she told me to wait till friday just as those fellows do when they have to find out from the clerks in the office what it is they ought to say you will go again on friday she asked of course i must it is not likely that she should come to me and then if she says that she'd rather not i must come home once more with my tail between my legs i do not think she will say that how can you tell it is the nature of a girl i think said lady frances to doubt a little when she thinks that she can love but not to doubt at all when she feels that she cannot she may be persuaded afterwards to change her mind but at first she is certain enough i call that shilly shally not at all the girl i'm speaking of is honest throughout and miss fay will have been honest should she accept you now it is not often that such a one as you john can ask a girl in vain that is mean he said angrily that is imputing falseness and greed and dishonor to the girl i love if she has liked some fellow clerk in her father's office better than she likes me shall she accept me merely because i am my father's son it was not that of which i was thinking a man may have personal gifts which will certainly prevail with a girl young and unsullied by the world as i suppose is your marion fay bosh he said laughing as far as personal gifts are concerned one fellow is pretty nearly the same as another a girl has to be good-looking a man has got to have something to buy bread and cheese with after that it is all a mere matter of liking and disliking unless indeed people are dishonest which they very often are up to this period of his life lord hampstead had never met any girl whom he had thought it desirable to make his wife it was now two years since the present marchioness had endeavoured to arrange an alliance between him and her own niece lady amaldina hoville this though but two years had passed since seemed to him to have occurred at a distant period of his life very much had occurred to him during those two years his political creed had been strengthened by the convictions of others especially by those of george roden till it had included those advanced opinions which had been described he had annoyed and then dismayed his father by his continual refusal to go into parliament he had taken to himself ways of living of his own which gave to him the manners and appearance of a more advanced age at that period two years since his stepmother still conceived high hopes of him even though he would occasionally utter in her presence opinions which seemed to be terrible he was then not of age and there would be time enough for a woman of her tact and intellect to cure all those follies the best way of curing them she thought would be by arranging a marriage between the heir to the marquisate and the daughter of so distinguished a conservative peer as her brother-in-law lord persiflage 
having this high object in view she opened the matter with diplomatic caution to her sister lady persiflage had at that moment begun to regard lord lithithel as a possible son-in-law but was alive to the fact that lord hampstead possessed some superior advantages it was possible that her girl should really love such a one as lord hampstead hardly possible that there should be anything romantic in a marriage with the heir of the duke of marioneth as far as wealth and rank went there was enough in both competitors she whispered therefore to her girl the name of the younger aspirant aspirant as he might be hoped to be and the girl was not opposed to the idea only let there be no falling to the ground between two stools no starving for want of fodder between two bundles of hay lord lithithel had already begun to give symptoms no doubt he was bald no doubt he was preoccupied with parliament and the county there was no doubt that his wife would have to encounter that touch of ridicule which a young girl incurs when she marries a man altogether removed beyond the world of romance but dukes are scarce and the man of business was known to be a man of high honor there would be no gambling no difficulties no possible question of a want of money and then his politics were the grandest known in england those of an old tory willing always to work for his party without desiring any of those rewards which the party wishes to divide among as select a number as possible what lord hampstead might turn out to be there was as yet no knowing he had already declared himself to be a radical he was fond of hunting and it was quite on the cards that he should take to newmarket then too his father might live for five-and-twenty years whereas the duke of marioneth was already nearly eighty but hampstead was as beautiful as a young phoebus and the pair would instantly become famous if only from their good looks alone the chance was given to lady amaldina but only given on the understanding that she must make very quick work of her time hampstead was coaxed down to castle hoboy for a month in september with an idea that the young lovers might be as romantic as they pleased among the lakes some little romance there was but at the end of the first week emaldina wisely told her mother that the thing wouldn't do she would always be glad to regard lord hampstead as a cousin but as to anything else there must be an end of it i shall some day give up my title and abandon the property to freddy i shall then go to the united states and do the best i can there to earn my own bread this little speech made by the proposed lover to the girl he was expected to marry opened lady amaldina's eyes to the danger of her situation lord lithithel was induced to spend two days in the following month at castle hoboy and then the arrangements for the welsh alliance were completed from that time forth a feeling of ill-will on the part of lady kingsbury towards her stepson had grown and become strong from month to month she had not at first conceived any idea that her lord frederick ought to come to the throne that had come gradually when she perceived or thought that she perceived that hampstead would hardly make a marriage properly aristocratic hitherto no tidings of any proposed marriage had reached her ears she lived at last in daily fear as any marriage would be the almost sure forerunner of a little lord highgate if something might happen something which she had taught herself to regard as beneficent and fitting rather than fatal something which might ensure to her little lord frederick those prospects which he had almost a right to expect then in spite of all her sufferings heaven would have done something for her for which she might be thankful what will her ladyship say when she hears of my maid marion said hampstead to his sister on the christmas day before his further visit to holloway will it matter much asked lady frances 
I think my feelings towards her are softer than yours. She is silly, arrogant, harsh, and insolent to my father, and altogether unprincipled in her expectations and ambitions. What a character you give her, said his sister. But nevertheless I feel for her to such an extent that I almost think I ought to abolish myself. I cannot say that I feel for her. It is all for her son that she wants it, and I agree with her in thinking that Freddy will be better fitted than I am for the position in question. I am determined to marry Marion if I can get her, but all the Traffords, unless it be yourself, will be broken-hearted at such a marriage. If once I have a son of my own, the matter will be hopeless. If I were to call myself Snooks, and refuse to take a shilling from the property, I should do them no good. Marion's boy would be just as much in their way as I am. What a way of looking at it! How my stepmother will hate her! A Quaker's daughter, a clerk at Pogson and Littlebird's, living at Paradise Row! Can't you see her? Is it not hard upon her that we should both go to Paradise Row? Lady Frances could not keep herself from laughing. You can't do her any permanent injury, because you are only a girl. But I think she will poison me. It will end in her getting Mr. Greenwood to give me some broth. John, you are too terrible. If I could be on the jury afterwards, I would certainly acquit them both on the ground of extreme provocation. Early on the following morning he was in a fidget, having fixed no hour for his visit to Holloway. It was not likely that she should be out or engaged, but he determined not to go till after lunch. All employment was out of the question, and he was rather a trouble to his sister. But in the course of the morning there came a letter which did for a while occupy his thoughts. The envelope was addressed in a hand he did not know, and was absurdly addressed to the Right Honorable the Lord Hampstead. I wonder who this ass is, said he, tearing it open. The ass was Samuel Crocker, and the letter was as follows. Heathcote Street, Mecklenburg Square, Christmas Day, 18 blank. My dear Lord Hampstead, I hope I may be excused for addressing your lordship in this familiar manner. I take occasion of this happy day to write to your lordship on a message of peace. Since I had the honor of meeting you at your noble uncle's mansion, Castle Hoboy, I have considered it one of the greatest delights of my life to be able to boast of your acquaintance. You will not, I am sure, forget that we have been fellow sportsmen and that we rode together on that celebrated run when we killed our fox in the field just over airy force i shall never forget the occasion or how well your lordship went over our rough country to my mind there is no bond of union so strong as that of sport up strikes little davy with his musical horn i am sure you will remember that my lord and the beautiful song to which it belongs I remember, too, how, as we were riding home after the run, your lordship was talking all the way about our mutual friend George Roden. He is a man for whom I have a most sincere regard, both as being an excellent public servant and as a friend of your lordship's. It is quite a pleasure to see the way in which he devotes himself to the service, as I do also. When you have taken the Queen's shilling, you ought to earn it. Those are my principles, my lord. We have a couple of young boys there whose only object it is to get through the day and eat their lunches. I always tell them that official hours ain't their own. I suppose they'll understand me some day. But as I was saying to your lordship about George Roden, there has something come up which I don't quite understand, which seems to have turned him against me. Nothing has ever given me so much pleasure as when I heard of his prospects as to a certain matter, which your lordship will know what I mean. 
nothing could be more flattering than the way i've wished him joy ever so many times so i do also your lordship and her ladyship because he is a most respectable young man though his station in life isn't so high as some people's but a clerk in h m s has always been taken for a gentleman which i am proud to think is my position as well as his but as i was saying to your lordship something seems to have gone against him as to our mutual friendship he sits there opposite and won't speak a word to me except just to answer a question and that hardly civil he is as sweet as sugar to those fellows who ain't at the same desk with him as i am or i should think it was his future prospects were making him upsetting couldn't your lordship do something to make things up between us again especially on this festive occasion i'm sure your lordship will remember how pleasant we were together at castle hoboy and at the hunt and especially as we were riding home together on that day i did take the liberty of calling at hendon hall when her ladyship was kind enough to see me of course there was a delicacy in speaking to her ladyship about mr roden which nobody could understand better than i do but i think she made me something of a promise that she would say a word when the proper time might come it could only have been a joke of mine and i do joke sometimes as your lordship may have observed but i shouldn't think roden would be the man to be mortally offended by anything of that sort anyway i will leave the matter in your lordship's hands merely remarking that as your lordship may remember blessed are the peacemakers for theirs is the kingdom of heaven i have the honor to be my dear lord hampstead your lordship's most obedient very humble servant samuel crocker fretful and impatient as he was on that morning it was impossible for hampstead not to laugh at this letter he showed it to his sister who in spite of her annoyance was constrained to laugh also i shall tell george to take him to his bosom at once said he why should george be bothered with him because george can't help himself they sit at the same desk together as crocker has not forgotten to tell me a dozen times when a man perseveres in this way and is thick-skinned enough to bear all rebuffs there is nothing he will not accomplish i have no doubt he will be riding my horses in leicestershire before the season is over an answer however was written to him in the following words dear mr crocker i am afraid i cannot interfere with mr roden who doesn't like to be dictated to in such matters yours truly hampstead there said he i do not think he can take that letter as a mark of friendship in this way the morning was passed till the time came for the start to holloway lady frances standing at the hall door as he got into his trap saw that the fashion of his face was unusually serious end of section twenty six recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina section twenty seven of marion fay by anthony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain volume two chapter five the quaker's eloquence when the friday morning came in paradise row both father and daughter at number seventeen were full of thought as they came down to breakfast to each of them it was a day laden with importance the father's mind had been full of the matter ever since the news had been told to him he had received marian's positive assurance that such a marriage was altogether impossible with something of impatience till she had used that argument as to her own health which was so powerful with her on hearing that he had said nothing but had gone away nor had he spoken a word on the subject since but his mind had been full of it he had lost his wife and all his little ones as she had said 
but he had declared to himself with strong confidence that this child was to be spared to him. He was a man whose confidence was unbounded in things as to which he had resolved. It was as though he had determined, in spite of fate, in spite of God, that his Marion should live. And she had grown up under his eyes, if not robust, by no means a weak creature. She did her work about the house, and never complained. In his eyes she was very beautiful, but he saw nothing in her color which was not to him a sign of health. He told himself that it was nothing that she, having seen so many die in her own family, should condemn herself, but for himself he repudiated the idea, and declared to himself that she should not become an early victim. So thinking, he exercised his mind constantly during those few days in considering whether there was any adequate cause for the refusal which Marion had determined to give this man. He, in truth, was terribly anxious that this grand stroke of fortune should be acknowledged and accepted. He wanted nothing from the young lord himself, except perhaps that he might be the young lord's father-in-law but he did want it all, long for it all, pant for it all, on behalf of his girl. If all these good things came in his girl's way because of her beauty, her grace, and her merit, why should they not be accepted? Others not only accepted these things for their daughters, but hunted for them, cheated for them, did all mean things in searching for them, and had their tricks and their lies regarded by the world quite as a matter of course, because it was natural that parents should be anxious for their children. He had not hunted, he had not cheated. The thing had come in his girl's way. The man had found her to be the most lovely, the most attractive, the most lovable among all whom he had seen. And was this glory to be thrown away because she had filled her mind with false fears? Though she were to die, must not the man take his chance with her as do other husbands in marrying other wives? He had been thinking of this, and of nothing but this, during the days which had intervened since Lord Hampstead had been in Paradise Row. He had not said a word to his daughter had indeed not dared to say a word to her, so abhorrent to him was the idea of discussing with her the probabilities of her own living or dying. And he was doubtful, too, whether any words coming from him at the present might not strengthen her in her resolution. If the man really loved her, he might prevail. His words would be stronger to overcome her than any that could be spoken by her father, and then, too, if he really loved her, the one repulse would not send him back for ever. It might perhaps be better that any arguments from her father should be postponed till she should have heard her lover's arguments. But his mind was so filled with the whole matter that he could not bring himself to assure himself certainly that his decision was the best. Though he was the one who rarely needed counsel from others, on this occasion he did need it, and now it was his purpose to ask counsel of Mrs. Roden before the moment should have come which might be fatal to his hopes. As this was the day immediately following Christmas, there was no business for him in the city. In order that the weary holiday might be quicker consumed, they breakfasted at number 17 an hour later than was usual. After breakfast he got through the morning as well as he could with his newspaper and some record of stocks and prices which he had brought with him from the city. So he remained fretful, doing nothing, pretending to read, but with his mind fixed upon the one subject till it was twelve o'clock at which hour he had determined to make his visit. At half-past one they were to dine each of them having calculated, without however a word having been spoken, 
that Lord Hampstead would certainly not come till the ceremony of dinner would be over. Though the matter was so vitally important to both of them, not a word concerning it was spoken. At twelve o'clock he took up his hat and walked out. "'You will be back punctually for dinner, father?' she asked. He made his promise simply by nodding his head, and then left the room. Five minutes afterwards he was closeted with Mrs. Roden in her drawing-room. Having conceived the difficulty of leading up to the subject gradually, he broke into it at once. "'Marion has told thee that this young man will be here to-day?' She simply assented. "'Hast thou advised her as to what she should say?' "'She has not seemed to want advice.' "'How should a girl not want advice in so great a matter?' "'How indeed! But yet she has needed none.' "'Has she told thee,' he asked, "'what it is in her mind to do?' "'I think so.' "'Has she said that she would refuse the man?' "'Yes, that certainly was her purpose.' "'And given the reasons?' he said, almost trembling as he asked the question. "'Yes, she gave her reasons.' "'And didst thou agree with her?' Before she could reply to this, Mrs. Roden felt herself compelled to pause. When she thought of that one strongest reason, fully as she agreed with it, she was unable to tell the father of the girl that she did so. She sat looking at him, wanting words with which she might express her full concurrence with Marian, without plunging a dagger into the other's heart. Then thou didst agree with her. There was something terrible in the intensity and slowness of the words as he repeated the question. On the whole I did, she said. I think that unequal marriages are rarely happy. That was all? he asked. Then, when she was again silent, he made the demand which was so important to him. Did she say aught of her health in discussing all this with thee? She did, Mr. Fay. And thou? It was a subject, my friend, on which I could not speak to her. All that was said came from her. Her mind was so fully made up, as I have said before. No advice from me could avail anything. With some people it is easy to see that, whether you agree with them or differ from them, it is impossible to turn them. But to me thou canst say whether thou hast agreed with her. Yes, I know well that the subject is one difficult to talk of in a father's hearing. But there are things which should be talked of, though the heart should break. After another pause he continued, Is there, thinkest thou, sufficient cause in the girl's health to bid her sever herself from these delights of life and customary habits which the Lord has intended for his creatures? At every separate question he paused, but when she was silent he went on with other questions. Is there that in her looks? Is there that in her present condition of life which makes it needful for thee, her friend, or for me, her father, to treat her as though she were already condemned by the hand of the Lord to an early grave? Then again, looking almost fiercely into her face, he went on with his examination. That is what thou art doing. Not I, not I. Yes, thou, my friend, thou, with all thy woman's softness in thy heart. It is what I shall do unless I bring myself to tell her that her fears are in vain. To me she has said that that is her reason. It is not that she cannot love the man. Has she not said as much to thee? Yes, truly. And art thou not assenting to it, unless thou tellest her that her fancies are not only vain, but wrong? Though thou hast not spoken the word, hast not thy silence assented as fully as words could do? Answer me at any rate to that. It is so, she said. 
is it then necessary to condemn her art thou justified in thine own thoughts in bidding her regard herself as one doomed again there was a pause what was she to say thou art aware that in our poor household she does all that the strictest economy would demand from an active mother of a family she is never idle if she suffers i do not see it she takes her food if not with a strong appetite yet regularly she is upright and walks with no languor no doctor comes near her if like others she requires change of air and scene what can give her such chance as this marriage hast thou not heard that for girls of feeble health marriage itself will strengthen them is she such that thou as her friend must bid her know that she must perish like a blighted flower must i bid her to hem and stitch her own winding-sheet it comes to that if no word be said to her to turn her from this belief she has seen them all die one after another one after another till the idea of death of death for herself as well as for them has gotten hold of her and yet it will be the case that one in a family shall escape i have asked among those who know and i have found that it is so the lord does not strike them all always but if she thinks that she is stricken then she will fall if she goes forth to meet death on the path death will come halfway to encounter her dost thou believe of me that it is because the man is a noble lord that i desire this marriage oh no mr fay he will take my child away from me she will then be but little to me what want i with lords who for the last few days of active life that are left to me would not change my city stool for any seat that any lord can give me but i shall know that she has had her chance in the world and has not been unnecessarily doomed to an early grave what would you have me do go to her and tell her that she should look forward with trust in god to such a state of health as he may vouchsafe to give her her thoughts are mostly with her god bid her not shorten his mercies bid her not to tell herself that she can examine his purposes bid her do in this as her nature bids her and if she can love this man give herself into his arms and leave the rest to the lord but he will be there at once if he be there what harm thou canst go when he comes to the door i shall go to her now and we shall dine together and then at once i will leave her when you see me pass the window then thou canst take thine occasion so saying without waiting for a promise he left her and went back to his own house and marion's heart had been full of many thoughts that morning some of them so trifling in their object that she herself would wonder at herself because that they should occupy her how should she be dressed to receive her lover in what words first should she speak to him and in what sort should she let any sign of love escape from her her resolution as to her great purpose was so fixed that there was no need for further thought on that matter it was on the little things that she was intent how far might she indulge herself in allowing some tenderness to escape her how best might she save him from any great pain and yet show him that she was proud that he had loved her in what dress she might receive him in that would she sit at table with her father it was christmas time and the occasion would justify whatever of feminine smartness her wardrobe possessed as she brought out from its recess the rich silk frock still all but new in which he had first seen her she told herself that she would probably have worn it for her father's sake had no lover been coming on the day before the christmas day she had worn it at church and the shoes with the pretty buckles and the sober but yet handsome morsel of lace which was made for her throat 
and which she had not been ashamed to wear at that memorable dinner, they were all brought out. It was Christmas, and her father's presence would surely have justified them all. And would she not wish to leave in her lover's eyes the memory of whatever prettiness she might have possessed? They were all produced, but when the moment came for arraying herself, they were all restored to their homes. She would be the simple Quaker girl as she was to be found there on Monday, on Tuesday, and on Wednesday. It would be better that he should know how little there was for him to lose. Zachary Fay ate his dinner almost without a word. She, though she smiled on him and tried to look contented, found it almost impossible to speak. She uttered some little phrases which she intended to be peculiar to the period of the year, but she felt that her father's mind was intent on what was coming, and she discontinued her efforts. She found it hardly possible to guess at the frame of his mind, so silent had he been since first he had yielded to her when she assured him of her purpose. But she had assured him, and he could not doubt her purpose. If he were unhappy for the moment, it was needful that he should be unhappy. There could be no change, and therefore it was well that he should be silent. He had hardly swallowed his dinner when he rose from his chair, and bringing in his hat from the passage, spoke a word to her before he departed. "'I am going into the city, Marion,' he said. "'I know it is well that I should be absent this afternoon. I shall return to tea.' God bless thee, my child. Marion, rising from her chair, kissed his lips and cheeks, and accompanied him to the door. It will be all well, my father, she said. It will be all well, and your child will be happy. About half an hour afterwards there came a knock at the door, and Marion for a moment thought that her lover was already there but it was Mrs. Roden who came up to her in the drawing-room. "'Am I in the way, Marion?' she asked. "'I will be gone in a minute, but perhaps I can say a word first. "'Why should you be in the way? "'He is coming.' "'Yes, I suppose so. "'He said that he would come. "'But what if he come? "'You and he are old friends. "'I would not be here to interrupt him.' I will escape when we hear the knock. Oh, Marion! What is it, Mrs. Roden? You are sad, and something troubles you. Yes, indeed, there is something which troubles me sorely. This lover of yours? It is fixed, dear friend, fixed as fate. It does not trouble me. It shall not trouble me. Why should it be a trouble? Suppose I had never seen him. But you have seen him, my child. Yes, indeed. And whether that be for good or evil, either to him or to me, it must be accepted. Nothing can now alter that. But I think, indeed, that it is a blessing. It will be something to me to remember that such a one as he has loved me. And for him... I would speak now of you, Marion. I am contented. It may be, Marion, that in this concerning your health you should be altogether wrong. How wrong? What right have you or I to say that the Lord has determined to shorten your days? Who has said so? It is on that theory that you are acting. No, not on that, not on that alone. Were I as strong as our other girls, as the very strongest, I would do the same. Has my father been with you? Yes, he has. My poor father. But it is of no avail. It would be wrong, and I will not do it. If I am to die, I must die. If I am to live, let me live. I shall not die, certainly, because I have resolved to send this fine lover away. However weak Marion Fay may be, she is strong enough not to pine for that. If there be no need. No need? 
What was it you said of unequal marriages? What was the story that you told me of your own? If I love this man, of whom am I to think the most? Could it be possible that I should be to him what a wife ought to be to her husband? Could I stand nobly on his hearthrug and make his great guests welcome? Should I be such a one that every day he should bless the kind fortune which had given him such a woman to help him to rule his house? How could I go from the littleness of these chambers to walk through his halls without showing that I knew myself to be an intruder? And yet I should be so proud that I should resent the looks of all who told me by their faces that I was so. He has done wrong in allowing himself to love me. He has done wrong in yielding to his passion, in telling me of his love. I will be wiser and nobler than he. If the Lord will help me, if my Saviour will be on my side, I will not do wrong. I did not think that you, Mrs. Roden, would turn against me. Turn against thee, Marion? I, to turn against thee? You should strengthen me. It seems to me that you want no strength from others. It is for your poor father that I would say a word. I would not have father believe that my health has aught to do with it. You know, you know what right I have to think that I am fit to marry and to hope to be the mother of children. It needs not that he should know. Let it suffice for him to be told that I am not equal to this greatness. A word escaped me in speaking to him, and I repent myself that I so spoke to him. But tell him, and tell him truly, that were my days fixed here for the next fifty years, were I sure of the rudest health, I would not carry my birth, my manners, my habits, into that young lord's house. How long would it be, Mrs. Roden, before he saw some little trick that would displease him? Some word would be wrongly spoken, some garment would be ill-folded, some awkward movement would tell the tale, and then he would feel that he had done wrong to marry the Quaker's daughter. All the virtues under the sun cannot bolster up love so as to stand the battery of one touch of disgust. Tell my father that, and tell him that I have done well. Then you can tell him also that, if God shall so choose it, I shall live a strong old maid for many years, to think night and day of his goodness to me, of his great love. Mrs. Roden, as she had come across from her own house, had known that her mission would fail. To persuade another against one's own belief is difficult in any case, but to persuade Marion Fay on such a matter as this was a task beyond the eloquence of man or woman. She had made up her mind that she must fail utterly when the knock came at the door. She took the girl in her arms and kissed her without further attempt. She would not even bid her think of it once again, as might have been so easy at parting. "'I will go into your room while he passes,' she said. As she did so, Lord Hampstead's voice was heard at the door. End of section 27 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 28 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2 Chapter 6. Marion's Obstinacy Lord Hampstead drove himself very fast from Hendon Hall to the Duchess of Edinburgh at Holloway, and then, jumping out of his trap, left it without saying a word to his servant, and walked quickly up Paradise Row till he came to number 17. There, without pausing a moment, he knocked sharply at the door. Going on such a business as this, he did not care who saw him. There was an idea present to him that he would be doing honor to Marion Fay if he made it known to all the world of Holloway that he had come there to ask her to be his wife. 
It was this feeling which had made him declare his purpose to his sister, and which restrained him from any concealment as to his going and coming. Marion was standing alone in the middle of the room, with her two hands clasped together, but with a smile on her face. She had considered much as to this moment, determining even the very words that she would use. The words probably were forgotten, but the purpose was all there. He had resolved upon nothing, had considered nothing, except that she should be made to understand that, because of his exceeding love, he required her to come to him as his wife. Marion, he said, Marion, you know why I am here. And he advanced to her as though he would at once have taken her in his arms. Yes, my lord, I know. You know that I love you. I think surely that never love was stronger than mine. If you can love me, say but the one word, and you will make me absolutely happy. To have you for my wife is all that the world can give me now. Why do you go from me? Is it to tell me that you cannot love me, Marion? Do not say that, or I think my heart will break. She could not say that, but as he paused for her answer, it was necessary that she should say something, and the first word spoken must tell the whole truth even though it might be that the word must be repeated often before he could be got to believe that it was an earnest word. My lord, she began. Oh, I do hate that form of address. My name is John. Because of certain conventional arrangements, the outside people call me Lord Hampstead. It is because I can be to you no more than one of the outside people that I call you my lord. Marion! Only one of the outside people. No more, though my gratitude to you, my appreciation, my friendship for you may be ever so strong. My father's daughter must be just one of the outside people to Lord Hampstead, and no more. Why so? Why do you say it? Why do you torment me? Why do you banish me at once, and tell me that I must go home a wretched, miserable man? Why, why, why? Because, my lord, I can give a reason, a good reason, a reason which I cannot oppose, though it must be fatal to me unless I can remove it a reason to which I must succumb if necessary, but to which, Marion, I will not succumb at once. If you say that you cannot love me, that will be a reason. If it were necessary that she should tell him a lie, she must do so. It would have been pleasant if she could have made him understand that she would be content to love him on condition that he would be content to leave her that she should continue to love him, that he should cease to love her, unless perhaps just a little. That had been a scheme for the future which had recommended itself to her. There should be a something left which should give a romance to her life, but which should leave him free in all things. It had been a dream in which she had listened, in which she had much trusted, but which, while she listened to the violence of his words, she acknowledged to herself to be almost impossible. She must tell the lie, but at the moment it seemed to her that there might be a middle course. I dare not love you, she said. Dare not love me, Marion? Who hinders you? Who tells you that you may not? Is it your father? No, my lord, no. Is it Mrs. Roden? No, my lord. This is a matter in which I could obey no friend, no father. I have had to ask myself, and I have told myself that I do not dare to love above my station in life. I am to have that bugbear again between me and my happiness? Between that and your immediate wishes, yes. Is it not so in all things? If I, even I, 
had set my heart upon some one below me, would not you, as my friend, have bade me conquer the feeling? I have set my heart on one whom, in the things of the world, I regard as my equal, in all other things as infinitely my superior. The compliment is very sweet to me, but I have trained myself to resist sweetness. It may not be, Lord Hampstead, it may not be. You do not know as yet how obstinate such a girl as I may become when she has to think of another's welfare, and a little, perhaps, of her own. Are you afraid of me? Yes. That I should not love you? Even of that. When you should come to see in me that which is not lovable, you would cease to love me. You would be good to me because your nature is good kind to me, because your nature is kind. You would not ill-treat me, because you are gentle, noble, and forgiving. But that would not suffice for me. I should see it in your eye, despite yourself, and hear it in your voice, even though you tried to hide it by occasional softness. I should eat my own heart when I came to see that you despised your Quaker wife, all that is nonsense, Marion. My lord? Say the word at once, if it has to be said, so that I may know what it is that I have to contend with. For you my heart is so full of love that it seems to be impossible that I should live without you. If there could be any sympathy, I should at once be happy. If there be none, say so. There is none. No spark of sympathy in you for me, for one who loves you so truly? When the question was put to her in that guise, she could not quite tell so monstrous a lie as would be needed for an answer fit for her purpose. This is a matter, Marion, in which a man has a right to demand an answer, to demand a true answer. Lord Hampstead, it may be that you should perplex me sorely. It may be that you should drive me away from you, and to beg you never to trouble me any further. It may be that you should force me to remain dumb before you, because that I cannot reply to you in proper words. But you will never alter my purpose. If you think well of Marian Fay, take her word when she gives it to you. I can never become your lordship's wife. Never? Never, certainly never. Have you told me why, all the reason why? I have told you enough, Lord Hampstead. By heaven, no! You have not answered me the one question that I have asked you. You have not given me the only reason which I would take, even for a while. Can you love me, Marion? If you loved me, you would spare me, she said. Then, feeling that such words utterly betrayed her, she recovered herself and went to work with what best eloquence was at her command to cheat him out of the direct answer which he required. I think, she said, you do not understand the workings of a girl's heart in such a matter. She does not dare to ask herself about her love, when she knows that loving would avail her nothing. For what purpose should I inquire into myself when the object of such inquiry has already been obtained? Why should I trouble myself to know whether this thing would be a gain to me or not, when I am well aware that I can never have the gain? Marion, I think you love me. She looked at him and tried to smile tried to utter some half-joking word, and then, as she felt that she could no longer repress her tears, she turned her face from him, and made no attempt at a reply. "'Marion,' he said again, "'I think that you love me.' "'If you loved me, my lord, you would not torture me.' She had seated herself now on the sofa, turning her face away from him over her shoulder, so that she might in some degree hide her tears. He sat himself at her side, 
and for a moment or two got possession of her hand. Marion, he said, pleading his case with all the strength of words which was at his command. You know, do you not, that no moment of life can be of more importance to me than this? Is it so, my lord? None can be so important. I am striving to get her for my companion in life, who to me is the sweetest of all human beings. To touch you as I do now is a joy to me, even though you have made my heart so sad. At the moment she struggled to get her hand away from him, but the struggle was not at first successful. You answer me with arguments which are to me of no avail at all. They are, to my thinking, simply a repetition of prejudices to which I have been all my life opposed. You will not be angry because I say so? Oh, no, my lord, she said. Not angry. I am not angry, but indeed you must not hold me. With that she extricated her hand, which he allowed to pass from his grasp as he continued his address to her. As to all that, I have my opinion, and you have yours. Can it be right that you should hold to your own and sacrifice me who have thought so much of what it is I want myself, if in truth you love me? Let your opinion stand against mine and neutralize it. Let mine stand against yours, and in that we shall be equal. Then, after that, let love be lord of all. If you love me, Marion, I think that I have a right to demand that you shall be my wife. There was something in this which she did not know how to answer. But she did know, she was quite sure, that no word of his, no tenderness either on his part or on her own, would induce her to yield an inch. It was her duty to sacrifice herself for him, for reasons which were quite apparent to herself, and she would do it. The fortress of her inner purpose was safe, although he had succeeded in breaking down the bulwark by which it had been her purpose to guard it. He had claimed her love, and she had not been strong enough to deny the claim. Let the bulwark go. She was bad at lying. Let her lie as she might, he had wit enough to see through it. She would not take the trouble to deny her love, should he persist in saying that it had been accorded to him. But surely she might succeed at last in making him understand that, whether she loved him or no, she would not marry him. I certainly shall never be your wife, she said. And that is all? What more, my lord? You can let me go and never wish me to return? I can, my lord. Your return would only be a trouble to you and a pain to me. Another time do not turn your eyes too often on a young woman, because her face may chance to please you. It is well that you should marry. Go and seek a wife with judgment among your own people. When you have done that, then you may return and tell Marion Fay that you have done well by following her advice. I will come again, and again, and again, and I will tell Marion Fay that her counsels are unnatural and impossible. I will teach her to know that the man who loves her can seek no other wife, that no other mode of living is possible to him than one in which he and Marion Fay shall be joined together. I think I shall persuade her at last that such is the case." I think she will come to know that all her cold prudence and worldly would-be wisdom can be of no avail to separate those who love each other. I think that when she finds that her lover so loves her that he cannot live without her, she will abandon those fears as to his future fickleness and trust herself to one of whose truth she will have assured herself. Then he took her hand and kneeling at her knee he kissed it before she was powerful enough to withdraw it. And so he left her, without another word, and mounting on his vehicle drove himself home without having exchanged a single word at Holloway with anyone save Marion Fay. 
she when she was left alone threw herself at full length on the sofa and burst into an ecstasy of tears trust herself to him yes indeed she would trust herself to him entirely only in order that she might have the joy for one hour of confessing her love to him openly let the consequences to herself afterwards be what they might as to that future injury to her pride of which she had spoken both to her father and also to her friend of which she had said so much to herself in discussing this matter with her own heart as to that he had convinced her it did not become her in any way to think of herself in this matter he certainly would be able to twist her as he would if she could stand upon no surer rock than her fears for her own happiness one kiss from him would be payment for it all but all his love all his sweetness all his truth all his eloquence should avail nothing with her towards overcoming that spirit of self-sacrifice by which she was dominated though he should extort from her all her secret that would be her strength though she should have to tell him of her failing health her certainly failing health though even that should be necessary she certainly would not be won from her purpose it might be sweet she thought to make him in all respect her friend of friends to tell him everything to keep no fear no doubt no aspiration a secret from him love you oh my dearest thou very pearl of my heart love you indeed oh yes do you not know that not even for an instant could i hide my love are you not aware did you not see at the moment that when you first knelt at my feet my heart had flown to you without an effort on my part to arrest it but now my beloved one now we understand each other now there need be no reproaches between us now there need be no speaking of distrust i am all yours only it is not fit as you know dearest that the poor quaker girl should become your wife now that we both understand that why should we be sad why should we mourn why should she not succeed in bringing things to such a pass as this and if so why should life be unhappy either to him or to her thus she was thinking of it till she had almost brought herself to a state of bliss when her father returned to her father she said getting up and embracing his arms as he stood it is all over what is over asked the quaker he has been here well marion and what has he said what he said it is hardly for me to tell you what i said i would you could know it all without my repeating a word of it has he gone away contented nay not that father i hardly expected that i hardly hoped for that had he been quite contented perhaps i might not have been so why should you not have both been made happy asked the father it may be that we shall be so it may be that he shall understand thou hast not taken his offer then oh no no father no i can never accept his offer if that be in your mind put it forth you shall never see your marion the wife of any man whether of that young lord or of another more fitted to her no one ever shall be allowed to speak to me as he has spoken why dost thou make thyself different from other girls he said angrily oh father father it is romance and false sentiment than which nothing is more odious to me there is no reason why thou shouldst be different from others the lord has not marked thee out as different from other girls either in his pleasure or his displeasure it is wrong for thee to think it of thyself she looked up piteously into his face but said not a word 
It is thy duty to take thyself from his hands as he has made thee, and to give way to no vain ecstatic terrors. If, as I gather from thy words, this young man be dear to thee, and if, as I gather from this second coming of his, thou art dear to him, then I, as thy father, tell thee that thy duty calls thee to him. It is not that he is a lord. Oh, no, father. It is not, I say, that he is a lord, or that he is rich, or that he is comely to the eyes that I would have thee go to him as his wife. It is because thou and he love each other, as it is the ordinance of the Lord Almighty that men and women should do. Marriage is honorable, and I, thy father, would fain see thee married. I believe the young man to be good and true. I could give thee to him, lord though he be, with a trusting heart, and think that in so disposing of my child I had done well for her. Think of this, Marion, if it be not already too late. All this he had said standing, so that he was able to leave the room without the ceremony of rising from his chair. Without giving her a moment for reply, having his hand on the lock of the door as he uttered the last words of his counsel to her, he marched off, leaving her alone. It may be doubted whether, at the moment, she could have found words for reply, so full was her heart with the feelings that were crowded there. But she was well aware that all her father's words could go for nothing. Of only one thing was she sure, that no counsel, no eloquence, no love would ever induce her to become the wife of Lord Hampstead. End of section 28 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 29 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 7 Mrs. Demijohn's Party Mrs. Demijohn presents her compliments to Mr. Crocker and begs the honor of his company to tea at nine o'clock on Wednesday, 31st of December, to see the new year in. R.I.V.P. Do come, C.D. 10 Paradise Row, Holloway. This note was delivered to Crocker on his arrival at his office on the morning of Saturday, the 27th. It must be explained that Crocker had lately made the acquaintance of Miss Clara Demijohn without any very formal introduction. Crocker, with that determination which marked his character, in pursuit of the one present purport of his mind, to effect a friendly reconciliation with George Roden, had taken himself down to Holloway, and had called at number eleven, thinking that he might induce his friend's mother to act on his behalf in a matter appertaining to peace and charity. Mrs. Roden had unhappily been from home, but he had had the good fortune to encounter Miss Demijohn. Perhaps it was that she had seen him going in and out of the house, and had associated him with the great mystery of the young nobleman. Perhaps she had been simply attracted by the easy air with which he cocked his hat and swung his gloves, or perhaps it was simply chance. But so it was that in the gloom of the evening she met him just round the corner opposite to the Duchess of Edinburgh, and the happy acquaintance was commenced. No doubt, as in all such cases, it was the gentleman who spoke first. Let us, at any rate, hope so, for the sake of Paradise Row generally. Be that as it may, before many minutes were over, she had explained to him that Mrs. Roden had gone out in a cab soon after dinner, and that probably something was up at Wimbledon as Mrs. Roden never went anywhere else, and this was not the day of the week on which her visits to Mrs. Vincent were generally made. 
Crocker, who was simplicity itself, soon gave her various details as to his own character and position in life. He, too, was a clerk in the post office, and was George Roden's particular friend. Oh, yes, he knew all about Lord Hampstead, and was, he might say, intimately acquainted with his lordship. He had been in the habit of meeting his lordship at Castle Hoboy, the seat of his friend, Lord Persiflage, and had often ridden with his lordship in the hunting field. He knew all about Lady Frances and the engagement, and had had the pleasure of making the acquaintance of her ladyship. He had been corresponding lately with Lord Hampstead on the subject. No, he had not as yet heard anything of Marion Fay, the Quaker's daughter. Then Clara had something to say on her side. She quite understood that if she expected to be communicated with, she also must communicate, and moreover, young Mr. Crocker was, by his age, appearance, and sex, just such a one as prompted her to be communicative without loss of self-respect. What was the good of telling things to Mrs. Duffer, who was only an old widow without any friends, and with very small means of existence? She had communicated her secrets to Mrs. Duffer simply from want of a better pair of ears into which she could pour them. But here was one in telling secrets to whom she could take delight, and who had secrets of his own to give in return. It is not to be supposed that the friendship which arose grew from the incidents of one meeting only. On that first evening, Crocker could not leave the fair one without making arrangements for a further interview, and so the matter grew. The intimacy between them was already of three days' standing when the letter of invitation above given reached Crocker's hands. To tell the very truth, the proposed party was made up chiefly for Crocker's sake. What is the good of having a young man if you cannot show him to your friends? Crocker? said Mrs. Demijohn to her niece. Where did you pick up Crocker? What questions you do ask, aunt? Pick him up indeed. So you have picked him up, as you're always doing with young men. Only you never know how to keep em when you've got em. I declare, aunt, your vulgarity is unbearable. I'm not going to have any crocker in my house, said the old woman, unless I know where he comes from. Perhaps he's a counter-skipper. He may be a ticket-of-leave man, for all I know. Aunt Jemima, you're so provoking that I sometimes think I shall have to leave you. And where will you go to, my dear? To this question, which had often been asked before, Clara thought it unnecessary to make any answer, but returned at once to the inquiries which were not unnaturally made by the lady who stood to her in the place of a mother. Mr. Crocker, Aunt Jemima, is a clerk in the post office, who sits at the same desk with George Roden, and is intimately acquainted both with Lord Hampstead and with Lady Frances Trafford. He used to be George Roden's bosom friend, but there has lately been some little tiff between the young men, which would be so pleasant if we could make it up. You have got to a speaking acquaintance with Mrs. Roden, and perhaps, if you will ask them, they'll come. I am sure Mary and Fay will come, because you always get your money from Pogson and Littlebird. I wish I had the cheek to ask Lord Hampstead. Having heard all this, the old lady consented to receive our sporting friend from the post office, and also assented to the other invitations which were given. Crocker, of course, sent his compliments, and expressed the great pleasure he would have in seeing the new year in, in company with Mrs. Demijohn. As the old lady was much afflicted with rheumatism, the proposition as coming from her would have been indiscreet, had she not known that her niece, on such occasions, was well able to act as her deputy. Mrs. Roden also promised to come, 
and with difficulty persuaded her son that it would be gracious on his part to be so far civil to his neighbors. Had he known that Crocker also would be there, he certainly would not have yielded. But Crocker, when at the office, kept the secret of his engagement to himself. The Quaker also, and Marion Fay, were to be there. Mr. Fay and Mrs. Demijohn had long known each other in regard to matters of business, and he, for the sake of Messrs. Pogson and Littlebird's firm, could not refuse to drink a cup of tea at their client's house. A junior clerk from the same counting-house, one Daniel Tribbledale by name, with whom Clara had made acquaintance at King's Court some two years since, was also to be of the party. Mr. Tribbledale had at one time, among all Clara's young men, been the favorite. But circumstances had occurred which had somewhat lessened her good will towards him. Mr. Littlebird had quarreled with him, and he had been refused promotion. It was generally supposed at the present time in the neighborhood of Old Broad Street that Daniel Tribbledale was languishing for the love of Clara Demijohn. Mrs. Duffer, of course, was to be there, and so the list of friends for the festive occasion was completed. Mrs. Duffer was the first to come. Her aid, indeed, was required for the cutting up of the cakes and arrangements of the cups and saucers. The Quaker and his daughter were next, appearing exactly at nine o'clock, to do which he protested to be the best sign of good manners that could be shown. "'If they want me at ten, why do they ask me at nine? demanded the Quaker. Marion was forced to give way, though she was by no means anxious to spend a long evening in company with Mrs. Demijohn. As to that seeing of the New Year in, it was quite out of the question for the Quaker or for his daughter. The company altogether came early. The only touch of fashion evinced on this occasion was shown by Mr. Crocker. The rodents, with Mr. Tribbledale at their heels, appeared not long after Mr. Fay, and then the demolition of the Sarah Lunns was commenced. "'I declare I think he means to deceive us,' whispered Clara to her friend Mrs. Duffer, when all the good tea had been consumed before the young men appeared. "'I don't suppose he cares much for tea,' said Mrs. Duffer. "'They don't nowadays.' "'It isn't just for the tea that a man is expected to come,' said Clara indignantly. "'It was now nearly ten and she could not but feel that the evening was going heavily. Tribbledale had said one tender word to her, but she had snubbed him, expecting Crocker to be there almost at once, and he had retired silent into a corner. George Roden had altogether declined to make himself agreeable to her, but as he was an engaged man, and engaged to a lady of rank, much could not be expected of him. Mrs. Roden and the Quaker and Mrs. Demijohn did manage to keep up something of conversation. Roden, from time to time, said a few words to Marion. Clara, who was repenting herself of her hardness to young Tribbledale, was forced to put up with Mrs. Duffer. When suddenly there came a thundering knock at the door, and Mr. Crocker was announced by the maid, who had been duly instructed beforehand as to all peculiarities in the names of the guests. There was a little stir, as there always is when a solitary guest comes in much after the appointed time. Of course there was rebuke, suppressed rebuke from Mrs. Demijohn, mild rebuke from Mrs. Duffer, a very outburst of rebuke from Clara, but Crocker was up to the occasion. "'Upon my words, lady, I had no help for it. I was dining with a few friends in the city, and I couldn't get away earlier. If my own ideas of happiness had been consulted, I should have been here an hour ago. Ah, Roden, how are you? Though I know you live in the same street, 
I didn't think of meeting you. Roden gave him a nod, but did not vouchsafe him a word. How's his lordship? I told you, didn't I, that I had heard from him the other day? Crocker had mentioned more than once at his office the fact that he had received a letter from Lord Hampstead. I don't often see him, and very rarely hear from him, said Roden, without turning away from Marion, to whom he was at that moment speaking. If all our young noblemen were like Hampstead, said Crocker, who had told the truth in declaring that he had been dining, England would be a very different sort of place from what it is. The most affable young lord that ever sat in the House of Peers. Then he turned himself towards Marion Fay, at whose identity he made a guess. He was anxious at once to claim her as a mutual friend, as connected with himself by her connection with the lord in question but as he could find no immediate excuse for introducing himself, he only winked at her. "'Are you acquainted with Mr. Tribbledale, Mr. Crocker?' asked Clara. "'Never had the pleasure as yet,' said Crocker. Then the introduction was effected. "'In the civil service?' asked Crocker. Tribbledale blushed, and of necessity repudiated the honour. I thought perhaps you were in the customs. You have something of the H.M.S. cut about you. Tribbledale acknowledged the compliment with a bow. I think the service is the best thing a man can do with himself, continued Crocker. It is genteel, said Mrs. Duffer. And the hour is so pleasant, said Clara. Bank clerks have always to be there by nine. "'Is a young man to be afraid of that?' asked the Quaker indignantly. Ten till four, with one hour for the newspapers and another for lunch. See the consequence? I never knew a young man yet from a public office who understood the meaning of a day's work.' "'I think that is a little hard,' said Roden. "'If a man really works,' Six hours continuously is as much as he can do with any good to his employers or himself. "'Well done, Roden,' said Crocker. "'Stick up for Her Majesty's shop.' Roden turned himself more round than before, and continued to address himself to Marion. "'Our employers wouldn't think much of us,' said the Quaker, "'if we didn't do better for them than that in private offices.' I say that the civil service destroys a young man and teaches him to think that the bread of idleness is sweet. As far as I can see, nothing is so destructive of individual energy as what is called public money. If Daniel Tribbledale would bestir himself, he might do very well in the world without envying any young man his seat either at the custom house or the post office. Mr. Fay had spoken so seriously that they all declined to carry that subject further. Mrs. Demijohn and Mrs. Duffer murmured their agreement, thinking it civil to do so, as the Quaker was a guest. Tribbledale sat silent in his corner, awestruck at the idea of having given rise to the conversation. Crocker winked at Mrs. Demijohn and thrust his hands into his pockets, as much as to say that he could get the better of the Quaker altogether if he chose to exercise his powers of wit and argument. Soon after this Mr. Fay rose to take his daughter away. But, said Clara, with affected indignation, you are to see the old year out and the new year in. I have seen enough of the one, said Mr. Fay, and shall see enough of the other if i live to be as near its close as i am to its birth but there are refreshments coming up said mrs demijohn i have refreshed myself sufficiently with thy tea madam i rarely take anything stronger before retiring to my rest come marion 
thou requirest to be at no form of welcoming the new year thou too wilt be better in thy bed as thy duties call upon thee to be early so saying the quaker bowed formally to each person present and took his daughter out with him under his arm mrs roden and her son escaped almost at the same moment and mrs demijohn having waited to take what she called just a thimbleful of hot toddy went also to her rest here's a pretty way of seeing the new year in said clara laughing we are quite enough of us for the purpose said crocker unless we also are expected to go away but as he spoke he mixed a tumbler of brandy and water which he divided among two smaller glasses handing them to the two ladies present i declare said mrs duffer i never do anything of the kind almost never on such an occasion as this everybody does it said crocker i hope mr tribbledale will join us said clara then the bashful clerk came out of his corner and seating himself at the table prepared to do as he was bid he made his toddy very weak not because he disliked brandy but guided by an innate spirit of modesty which prevented him always from going more than half way when he was in company then the evening became very pleasant you are quite sure that he is really engaged to her ladyship asked clara i wish i were as certainly engaged to you replied the polite crocker what nonsense you do talk mr crocker and before other people too but you think he is i am sure of it both hampstead and she have told me so much themselves out of their own mouths my exclaimed mrs duffer and here's her brother engaged to marion fay said clara crocker declared that as to this he was by no means so well assured lord hampstead in spite of their intimacy had told him nothing about it but it is so mr crocker as sure as ever you are sitting there he has been coming here after her over and over again and was closeted with her only last friday for hours it was a holiday but that sly old quaker went out of the way so as to leave them together that mrs roden though she's as stiff as buckram knows all about it to the best of my belief she got it all up marion fay is with her every day it's my belief there's something we don't understand yet she's got a hold of them young people and means to do just what she likes with them crocker however could not agree to this he had heard of lord hampstead's peculiar politics and was assured that the young lord was only carrying out his peculiar principles in selecting marion fay for himself and devoting his sister to george roden not that i like that kind of thing if you ask me said crocker i'm very fond of hampstead and i've always found lady frances to be a pleasant and affable lady i've no cause to speak other than civil of both of them but when a man has been born a lord and a lady a lady a lady of that kind miss demijohn oh exactly titled you mean mr crocker quite high among the knobs you know hampstead will be a marquis some of these days which is next to a duke and do you know him yourself asked tribbledale with a voice of awe oh yes said crocker to speak to him when you see him i had a long correspondence with him about a week ago about a matter which interested both of us very much and how does he address you asked clara also with something of awe dear crocker just that i always say my dear lord hampstead in return i look upon dear hampstead as a little vulgar you know and i always think that one ought to be particular in these matters but as i was saying 
when it comes to marriage people ought to be true to themselves now if i was a marquis i don't know what i mightn't do if i saw you you know clara clara pouted but did not appear to have been offended either by the compliment or by the familiarity but under any other circumstances less forcible i would stick to my order so would i said mrs duffer marquises ought to marry marquises and dukes dukes there it is said clara and now we must drink its health and i hope we may be all married to them we like best before it comes round again this had reference to the little clock on the mantelpiece the hands of which had just crept round to twelve o'clock i wish we might said crocker and have a baby in the cradle too go away said clara that would be quick said mrs duffer what do you say mr tribbledale where my heart's fixed said tribbledale who was just becoming warm with the brandy and water there ain't no hope for this year nor yet for the one after whereupon crocker remarked that care killed a cat you just put on your coat and hat and take me across to my lodgings see if i don't give you a chance said mrs duffer who was also becoming somewhat merry under the influences of the moment but she knew that it was her duty to do something for her young hostess and true woman as she was thought that this was the best way of doing it tribbledale did as he was bid though he was obliged thus to leave his lady-love and her new admirer together do you really mean it said clara when she and crocker were alone of course i do honest said crocker then you may said clara turning her face to him end of section twenty nine recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina section thirty of marion fay by anthony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain volume two chapter eight new year's day crocker had by no means as yet got through his evening having dined with his friends in the city and drank tea with the lady of his love he was disposed to proceed if not to pleasanter delights at any rate to those which might be more hilarious every londoner from holloway up to gower street in which he lived would be seeing the new year in and beyond gower street down in holborn and from thence all across to the strand especially in the neighbourhood of covent garden and the theatres there would be a whole world of happy revellers engaged in the same way on such a night as this there could certainly be no need of going to bed soon after twelve for such a one as samuel crocker in paradise row he again encountered tribbledale and suggested to that young man that they should first have a glass of something at the duchess and then proceed to more exalted realms in a hansom i did think of walking there this fine starlight night said tribbledale mindful of the small stipend at which his services were at present valued by pogson and littlebird but crocker soon got the better of all this i'll stand sammy for this occasion said he the new year comes in only once in twelve months then tribbledale went into the duchess and after that was as indifferent while his money lasted him as was crocker himself i've loved that girl for three years said tribbledale as soon as they had left the duchess and were again in the open air it was a beautiful night and crocker thought that they might as well walk a little way it was pleasant under the bright stars to hear of the love adventures of his new friend especially as he himself was now the happy hero for three years he asked indeed i have crocker that glass of hot whisky and water 
though it enhanced the melancholy tenderness of the young man, robbed him of his bashfulness, and loosened the strings of his tongue. For three years! And there was a time when she worshipped the very stool on which I sat at the office. I don't like to boast. You have to be short, sharp, and decisive if you mean to get a girl like that to travel with you. I should have taken the ball at the hop, Crocker. That's what I ought to have done. But I see it all now. She's as fickle as she is fair. Fickler, perhaps, if anything. Come, Tribbledale, I ain't going to let you abuse her, you know. I don't want to abuse her. God knows I love her too well in spite of all that. It's your turn now. I can see that. There's a great many of them have had their turns. Were there now? asked Crocker anxiously. There was Pollocky, him at the Highbury Gas Works. He came after me. It was because of him she dropped me. Was that going on for a marriage? Right ahead, I used to think. Pollocky is a widower with five children. Oh, Lord! But he's the head of all the gas and has four hundred a year. It wasn't love as carried her on with him, I could see that. She wouldn't go and meet him anywhere about the city, as she did me. I suppose Pollocky is fifty if he's a day. And she dropped him also? Or else it was he. On receipt of this information, Crocker whistled. It was something about money, continued Tribbledale. The old woman wouldn't part. There is money, I suppose? The old woman has a lot. And isn't the niece to have it? asked Crocker. No doubt she will, because there never was a pair more loving but the old lady will keep it herself as long as she is here. Then there entered an idea into Crocker's head that if he could manage to make Clara his own, he might have power enough to manage the aunt as well as the niece. They had a little more whiskey and water at the Angel at Islington before they got into the cab which was to take them down to the Paphian Music Hall, and after that Tribbledale passed from the realm of partial fact to that of perfect poetry. He would never, he said, abandon Clara Demijohn, though he should live to an age beyond that of any known patriarch. He quite knew all that there was against him. Crocker, he thought, might probably prevail. He rather hoped that Crocker might prevail, for why should not so good a fellow be made happy? seeing how utterly impossible it was that he, Daniel Tribbledale, should ever reach that perfect bliss in dreaming of which he passed his miserable existence. But as to one thing he had quite made up his mind. The day that saw Clara Demijohn a bride would most undoubtedly be the last of his existence. "'Oh, no, damn it, you won't,' said Crocker, turning round upon him in the cab. I shall, said Tribbledale with emphasis, and I've made up my mind how to do it, too. They've caged up the monument, and you're so looked after on the Duke of York's that there isn't a chance. But there's nothing to prevent you from taking a header at the whispering gallery of St. Paul's. You'd be more talked of that way. And the vergers would be sure to show the stains made on the stones below. It was here young Tribbledale fell, a clerk at Pogson and Littlebirds, who dashed out his brains for love on the very day as Clara Demijohn got herself married. I'm of that disposition, Crocker, as I do anything for love, anything. Crocker was obliged to reply that he trusted he might never be the cause of such a fatal attempt at glory. But he went on to explain that, in the pursuit of love, a man could not in any degree give way to friendship. Even though numberless lovers might fall from the whispering gallery in a confused heap of mangled bodies, he must still tread the path which was open to him. These were his principles, and he could not abandon them even for the sake of Tribbledale. "'Nor would I have you,' shouted Tribbledale 
leaning out over the door of the cab. I would not delay you, not for a day, not for an hour. Were tomorrow to be your bridal morning, it would find me prepared. My only request to you is that a boy might be called Daniel after me. You might tell her it was an uncle or grandfather. She would never think that in her own child was perpetuated a monument of poor Daniel Tribbledale. Crocker, as he jumped out of the cab with a light step in front of the Paphian Hall, promised that, in this particular, he would attend to the wishes of his friend. The performances at the Paphian Hall on that festive occasion need not be described here with accuracy. The new year had been seen well in with music, dancing, and wine. The seeing of it in was continued yet for an hour, till an indulgent policeman was forced to interfere. It is believed that, on the final ejection of our two friends, the forlorn lover kept steady, no doubt by the weight of his woe, did find his way home to his lodgings. The exultant Crocker was less fortunate, and passed his night without the accommodation of sheets and blankets somewhere in the neighborhood of Bow Street. The fact is important to us, as it threatened to have considerable effect on our friend's position at his office. Having been locked up in a cell during the night, and kept in durance till he was brought on the following morning before a magistrate, he could not well be in his room at ten o'clock. Indeed, when he did escape from the hands of the Philistines, at about two in the day, sick, unwashed, and unfed, he thought it better to remain away altogether for that day. The great sin of total absence would be better than making an appearance before Mr. Jerningham in his present tell-tale condition. He well knew his own strength and his own weakness. All power of repartee would be gone from him for the day. Mr. Jerningham would domineer over him, and Aeolus, should the violent god be pleased to send for him, would at once annihilate him. So he sneaked home to Gower Street, took a hair of the dog that bit him, and then got the old woman who looked after him to make him some tea and to fry a bit of bacon for him. In this ignominious way he passed New Year's Day, at least so much of it as was left to him after the occurrences which have been described. But on the next morning the great weight of his troubles fell upon him heavily. In his very heart of hearts he was afraid of Aeolus. In spite of his brummagem courage, the wrath of the violent god was tremendous to him. He knew what it was to stand with his hand on the lock of the door and tremble before he dared to enter the room. There was something in the frown of the god which was terrible to him. There was something worse in the god's smile. He remembered how he had once been unable to move himself out of the room when the god had told him that he need not remain at the office but might go home and amuse himself just as he pleased. Nothing crushes a young man so much as an assurance that his presence can be dispensed with without loss to anyone. Though Crocker had often felt the mercies of Aeolus, and had told himself again and again that the god never did in truth lift up his hand for final irrevocable punishment, still he trembled as he anticipated the dread encounter. When the morning came, and while he was yet in his bed, he struggled to bethink himself by some strategy by which he might evade the evil hour. Could he have been sent for suddenly into Cumberland? but in this case he would, of course, have telegraphed to the post office on the preceding day. Could he have been taken ill with a fit, so as to make his absence absolutely necessary, say, for an entire week? He well knew that they had a doctor at the post office, a crafty, far-seeing, obdurate man, who would be with him at once, and who would show him no mercy. He had tried these schemes all round, and had found that there were none left with which Aeolus was not better acquainted than was he himself. There was nothing for it but to go and bear the brunt. Exactly at ten o'clock he entered the room, 
hung his hat up on the accustomed peg, and took his seat on the accustomed chair before anyone spoke a word to him. Roden, on the opposite seat, took no notice of him. "'Bedad, he's here anyhow this morning,' whispered Garrity to Bobbin very audibly. "'Mr. Crocker,' said Mr. Jerningham, "'you were absent throughout the entire day yesterday. "'Have you any account to give of yourself?' There was certainly falsehood implied in this question, as Mr. Jerningham knew very well what had become of Crocker. Crocker's misadventure at the police office had found its way into the newspapers, and had been discussed by Aeolus with Mr. Jerningham. I am afraid that Mr. Jerningham must have intended to tempt the culprit into some false excuse. "'I was horribly ill,' said Crocker without stopping the pen with which he was making entries in the big book before him. This no doubt was true, and so far the trap had been avoided. "'What made you ill, Mr. Crocker?' "'Headache.' "'It seems to me, Mr. Crocker, you're more subject to such attacks as these than any young man in the office.' "'I always was as a baby,' said Crocker resuming something of his courage. Could it be possible that Aeolus should not have heard of the day's absence? "'There is ill health of so aggravated a nature,' said Mr. Jerningham, "'as to make the sufferer altogether unfit for the civil service.' "'I'm happy to say I'm growing out of them gradually,' said Crocker. Then Garrity got up from his chair and whispered the whole truth into the sufferer's ears. "'It was all in the Pall Mall yesterday, and Aeolus knew it before he went away.' A sick qualm came upon the poor fellow, as though it were a repetition of yesterday's sufferings. But still it was necessary that he should say something. "'New Year's Day comes only once a year, I suppose.' It was only a few weeks since that you remained a day behind your time when you were on leave. But Sir Boreas has taken the matter up, and I have nothing to say to it. No doubt Sir Boreas will send for you. Sir Boreas Bodkin was that great civil servant in the general post office whom men were wont to call Aeolus. It was a wretched morning for poor Crocker, he was not sent for till one o'clock, just at the moment when he was going to eat his lunch. That horrid sickness, the combined result of the dinner in the city, of Mrs. Demijohn's brandy, and of the many whiskies which followed, still clung to him. The mutton chop and the porter which he had promised himself would have relieved him, but now he was obliged to appear before the god in all his weakness. Without a word he followed a messenger who had summoned him, with his tail only too visibly between his legs. Aeolus was writing a note when he was ushered into the room, and did not condescend to arrest himself in the progress merely because Crocker was present. Aeolus well knew the effect on a sinner of having to stand silent and all alone in the presence of an offended deity. "'So, Mr. Crocker,' said Aeolus at last, looking up from his completed work. No doubt you saw the old year out on Wednesday night. The jokes of the god were infinitely worse to bear than his most furious blasts. Like some other great men, continued Aeolus, you have contrived to have your festivities chronicled in the newspapers. Crocker found it impossible to utter a word. You have probably seen the Pall Mall of yesterday, and the standard of this morning. I haven't looked at the newspaper, sir, since— Since the festive occasion? suggested Aeolus. Oh, Sir Boreas. Well, Mr. Crocker, what is it that you have to say for yourself? I did dine with a few friends. And kept it up tolerably late, I should think. "'And then afterwards went to a tea-party,' said Crocker. "'A tea-party?' "'It was not all tea,' said Crocker, with a whine. "'I should think not. 
There was a good deal besides tea, I should say. Then the god left off to smile, and the blasts began to blow. Now, Mr. Crocker, I should like to know what you think of yourself. After having read the accounts of your appearance before the magistrate in two newspapers, I suppose I may take it for granted that you were abominably drunk out in the streets on Wednesday night. It is very hard for a young man to have to admit under any circumstances that he has been abominably drunk out in the streets, so that Crocker stood dumb before his accuser. I choose to have an answer, sir. I must either have your own acknowledgment, or must have an official account from the police magistrate. I had taken something, sir. Were you drunk? If you will not answer me, you had better go and I shall know how to deal with you. Crocker thought that he had perhaps better go and leave the god to deal with him. He remained quite silent. Your personal habits would be nothing to me, sir, continued Aeolus, if you were able to do your work and did not bring disgrace on the department. But you neglect the office, you are unable to do your work, and you do bring disgrace on the department. How long is it since you remained away a day before? I was detained down in Cumberland for one day, after my leave of absence. Detained in Cumberland. I never tell a gentleman, Mr. Crocker, that I do not believe him. Never. If it comes to that with a gentleman, he must go. This was hard to bear, but yet Crocker was aware that he had told a fib on that occasion in reference to the day's hunting. Then Sir Boreas took up his pen and again had recourse to his paper, as though the interview was over. Crocker remained standing, not quite knowing what he was expected to do. "'It's of no use your remaining there,' said Mr. Boreas. Whereupon Crocker retired, and with his tail still between his legs, returned to his own desk. Soon afterwards Mr. Jerningham was sent for, and came back with an intimation that Mr. Crocker's services were no longer required, at any rate for that day. When the matter had been properly represented to the Postmaster General, a letter would be written to him. The impression made on the minds of Bobbin and Geraghty was that poor Crocker would certainly be dismissed on this occasion. Roden, too, thought that it was now over with the unfortunate young man, as far as the Queen's service was concerned, and could not abstain from shaking hands with the unhappy wretch as he bade them all a melancholy good-bye. "'Good afternoon,' said Mr. Jerningham to him, severely, not condescending to shake hands with him at all. But Mr. Jerningham heard the last words which the god had spoken on the subject, and was not therefore called upon to be specially soft-hearted. "'I never saw a poor devil look so sick in my life,' Aeolus had said. "'He must have been very bad, Sir Boreas.' Aeolus was fond of a good dinner himself, and had a sympathy for convivial offences. Indeed, for all offences he had a sympathy— no man less prone to punish ever lived. But what is a man to do with inveterate offenders? Aeolus would tear his hair sometimes in dismay because he knew that he was retaining in the service men whom he would have been bound to get rid of had he done his duty. You had better tell him to go home, said Aeolus. For today, you know. And what then, Sir Boreas? I suppose he'll sleep it off by tomorrow. Have a letter written to him, to frighten him, you know. After all, New Year's Day only does come once a year. Mr. Jerningham, having thus received instructions, went back to his room and dismissed Crocker in the way we have seen. As soon as Crocker's back was turned, Roden was desired to write the letter. Sir, your conduct in absenting yourself without leave from the office yesterday is of such a nature as to make it necessary for me to inform you 
that should it be repeated i shall have no alternative but to bring your name under serious consideration of my lord the postmaster-general i am sir your obedient servant boreas bodkin in the same envelope was a short note from one of his brother clerks dear crocker you had better be here sharp at ten to-morrow mr jerningham bids me tell you yours truly bart bobbin thus crocker got through his troubles on this occasion end of section thirty recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina section thirty one of marion fay by anthony trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain volume two chapter nine miss demijohn's ingenuity on the day on which crocker was going through his purgatory at the post office a letter reached lady kingsbury at trafford park which added much to the troubles and annoyances felt by different members of the family there it was an anonymous letter and the reader who in regard to such mysteries should never be kept a moment in ignorance may as well be told at once that the letter was written by that enterprising young lady miss demijohn the letter was written on new year's day after the party perhaps in consequence of the party as the rash doings of some of the younger members of the trafford family were made specially obvious to miss demijohn by what was said on that occasion the letter ran as follows my lady marchioness i conceive it to be my duty as a well-wisher of the family to inform you that your stepson lord hampstead has become entangled in what i think to be a dangerous way with a young woman living in a neighboring street to this the neighboring street was of course a stroke of cunning on the part of miss demijohn she lives at number seventeen paradise row holloway and her name is marion fay she is daughter to an old quaker who is clerk to pogson and littlebird king's court great broad street and isn't of course in any position to entertain such hopes as these he may have a little money saved but what's that to the likes of your ladyship and his lordship the marquis some think she is pretty i don't now i don't like such cunning ways of what i tell your ladyship there isn't any manner of doubt his lordship was there for hours the other day and the girl is going about as proud as a peacock it's what i call a regular paradise row conspiracy and though the quaker has lent himself to it he ain't at the bottom next door but two to the fays there is a mrs roden living who has got a son a stuck-up fellow and a clerk in the post office i believe there isn't a bit of doubt but he has been and got himself engaged to another of your ladyship's noble family as to that all holloway is talking of it i don't believe there is a bus driver up and down the road as doesn't know it it's my belief that mrs roden is the doing of it all she has taken marion fay by the hand just as though she were her own and now she has got the young lord and the young lady right into her mashes if none of em isn't married yet it won't be long so unless somebody interferes if you don't believe me do you send to the duchess of edinburgh at the corner and you'll find that they know all about it now my lady marchioness i've thought it my duty to tell you all this because i don't like to see a noble family put upon there isn't nothing for me to get out of it myself but i do it just as one of the family's well-wishers therefore i sign myself your very respectful a well-wisher the young lady had told her story completely as far as her object was concerned which was simply that of making mischief but the business of anonymous letter-writing was one not new to her hand it is easy and offers considerable excitement to the minds of those whose time hangs heavy on their hands 
the marchioness though she would probably have declared beforehand that anonymous letters were of all things the most contemptible nevertheless read this more than once with a great deal of care and she believed it altogether as to lady frances of course she knew the allegations to be true seeing that the writer was so well acquainted with the facts as to lady frances why should she be less well informed in reference to lord hampstead such a marriage as this with the quaker girl was exactly the sort of match which hampstead would be pleased to make then she was especially annoyed by the publicity of the whole affair that holloway and the drivers of the omnibuses and the duchess of edinburgh should know all the secrets of her husband's family should be able to discuss the disgrace to which her own darlings would be subjected was terrible to her but perhaps the sting that went sharpest to her heart was that which came from the fact that lord hampstead was about to be married at all let the wife be a quaker or what not let her be as low as any woman that could be found within the sound of bow bells still if the marriage ceremony were once pronounced over them that woman's son would become lord highgate and would be heir to all the wealth and all the titles of the marquis of kingsbury to the absolute exclusion of the eldest born of her own darlings she had had her hopes in the impracticability of lord hampstead such men as that she had told herself were likely to keep themselves altogether free of marriage he would not improbably she thought entertain some abominable but not unlucky idea that marriage in itself was an absurdity at any rate there was hope as long as he could be kept unmarried were he to marry and then have a son even though he broke his neck out hunting next day no good would come of it in this condition of mind she thought it well to show the letter to mr greenwood before she read it to her husband lord kingsbury was still very ill so ill as to have given rise to much apprehension but still it would be necessary to discuss this letter with him ill as he might be only it should be first discussed with mr greenwood mr greenwood's face became flatter and his jaw longer and his eyes more like gooseberries as he read the letter he had gradually trained himself to say and to hear all manner of evil things about lady frances in the presence of the marchioness he had too accustomed himself to speak of lord hampstead as a great obstacle which it would be well if the lord would think proper to take out of the way he had also so far followed the lead of his patroness as to be deep if not loud in his denunciations of the folly of the marquis the marquis had sent him word that he had better look out for a new home and without naming an especial day for his dismissal had given him to understand that it would not be convenient to receive him again in the house in park lane but the marquis had been ill when he had thus expressed his displeasure and was now worse it might be that the marquis himself would never again visit park lane as no positive limit had been fixed for mr greenwood's departure from trafford park there he remained and there he intended to remain for the present as he folded up the letter carefully after reading it slowly he only shook his head is it true i wonder asked the marchioness there is no reason why it should not be that's just what i say to myself we know it is true about fanny of course there's that mr roden and the mrs roden when the writer knows so much there is reason to believe the rest a great many people do tell a great many lies said mr greenwood i suppose there is such a person as this quaker and that there is such a girl quite likely if so why shouldn't hampstead fall in love with her of course he's always going to the street because of his friend roden not a doubt lady kingsbury what ought we to do 
To this question Mr. Greenwood was not prepared with an immediate answer. If Lord Hampstead chose to get himself married to a Quaker's daughter, how could it be helped? His father would hardly have any influence over him now. Mr. Greenwood shook his head. And yet he must be told. Mr. Greenwood nodded his head. Perhaps something might be done about the property. He wouldn't care two straws about settlements, said Mr. Greenwood. He doesn't care about anything he ought to. If I were to write and ask him, would he tell the truth about this marriage? He wouldn't tell the truth about anything, said Mr. Greenwood. The Marchioness passed this by, though she knew it at the moment to be a calumny. But she was not unwilling to hear calumny against Lord Hampstead. There used to be ways, she said, in which a marriage of that kind could be put on one side afterwards. You must put it on one side before, nowadays, if you mean to do it at all, said the clergyman. But how? How? If he could be got out of the way. How out of the way? Well, that's what I don't know. Suppose he could be made to go out yachting, and she be married to somebody else when he's at sea. Lady Kingsbury felt that her friend was but little good at a stratagem, but she felt also that she was not very good herself. She could wish, but wishing in such matters is very vain. She had right on her side. She was quite confident as to that. There could be no doubt but that gods and men would desire to see her little Lord Frederick succeed to the Marquisate rather than this infidel Republican. If this wretched radical could be kept from marrying, there would eventually be room for hope. Because there was the fact, proved by the incontestable evidence of Burke's peerage, that younger sons did so often succeed but if another heir were to be born, then, as far as she was aware, Burke's peerage promised her nothing. "'It's a pity he shouldn't break his neck out hunting,' said Mr. Greenwood. "'Even that wouldn't be much if he were to be married first, said the Marchioness. Every day she went to her husband for half an hour before her lunch, at which time the nurse who attended him during the day was accustomed to go to her dinner. He had had a physician down from London since his son had visited him, and the physician had told the Marchioness that, though there was not apparently any immediate danger, still the symptoms were such as almost to preclude a hope of ultimate recovery. When this opinion had been pronounced, there had arisen between the Marchioness and the chaplain a discussion as to whether Lord Hampstead should be once again summoned. The Marquis himself had expressed no such wish. A bulletin of a certain fashion had been sent three or four times a week to Hendon Hall, purporting to express the doctor's opinion of the health of their noble patient. But the bulletin had not been scrupulously true, Neither of the two conspirators had wished to have Lord Hampstead at Trafford Park. Lady Kingsbury was anxious to make the separation complete between her own darlings and their brother, and Mr. Greenwood remembered, down to every tittle of a word and tone, the insolence of the rebuke which he had received from the heir. But if Lord Kingsbury were really to be dying, then they would hardly dare to keep his son in ignorance. I've got something I'd better show you, she said, as she seated herself by her husband's sofa. Then she proceeded to read to him the letter, without telling him as she did so that it was anonymous. When he had heard the first paragraph, he demanded to know the name of the writer. I'd better read it all first, said the Marchioness, and she did read it all to the end closing it, however, without mentioning the final well-wisher. "'Of course, it's anonymous,' she said, as she held the letter in her hand. "'Then I don't believe a word of it,' said the Marquis. "'Very likely not, but yet it sounds true.' 
I don't think it sounds true at all. Why should it be true? There is nothing so wicked as anonymous letters. If it isn't true about Hampstead, it's true at any rate of Fanny. That man comes from Holloway and Paradise Row and the Duchess of Edinburgh. Where Fanny goes for her lover, Hampstead is likely to follow. Birds of a feather flock together. I won't have you speak of my children in that way, said the sick lord. What can I do? Is it not true about Fanny? If you wish it, I will write to Hampstead and ask him all about it. In order to escape from the misery of the moment, he assented to this proposition. The letter, being anonymous, had to his thinking been disgraceful, and therefore he had disbelieved it. And having induced himself to disbelieve the statements made, he had been drawn into expressing, or at any rate to acknowledging by his silence, a conviction that such a marriage as that proposed with Marion Fay would be very base. Her ladyship felt, therefore, that if Lord Hampstead could be got to acknowledge the engagement, something would have been done towards establishing a quarrel between the father and the son. "'Has that man gone yet?' he asked, as his wife rose to leave the room. "'Has what man gone?' "'Mr. Greenwood.' "'Gone? How should he have gone? It has never been expected that he should go by this time. I don't see why he should go at all. He was told that you would not again require his services up in London. As far as I know, that is all that has been said about going.' The poor man turned himself on his sofa angrily, but did not at the moment give any further instructions as to the chaplain's departure. "'He wants to know why you have not gone,' Lady Kingsbury said to the clergyman that afternoon. "'Where am I to go?' whined the unfortunate one. "'Does he mean to say that I am to be turned out into the road at a moment's notice because I can't approve of what Lady Frances is doing? I haven't had any orders as to going. If I am to go, I suppose he will make some arrangement first. Lady Kingsbury said what she could to comfort him, and explained that there was no necessity for his immediate departure. Perhaps the Marquis might not think of it again for a week or two, and there was no knowing in what condition they might find themselves. Her ladyship's letter to her stepson was as follows, and by return of post her stepson's answer came. My dear Hampstead, tidings have reached your father that you have engaged yourself to marry a girl, the daughter of a Quaker named Fay, living at number 17 Paradise Row. He, the Quaker, is represented as being a clerk in a counting-house in the city. Of the girl your father has heard nothing, but can only imagine that she should be such as her position would make probable. He desires me to ask you whether there is any truth in the statement. You will observe that I express no opinion myself, whether it be true or false, whether proper or improper. After your conduct the other day, I should not think of interfering myself. But your father wishes me to ask for his information. Yours truly, Clara Kingsbury. Hampstead's answer was very short, but quite sufficient for the purpose. My dear Lady Kingsbury, I am not engaged to marry Miss Fay, as yet. I think that I may be some day soon. Yours affectionately, Hampstead. By the same post he wrote a letter to his father, and that shall also be shown to the reader. My dear father, I have received a letter from Lady Kingsbury asking me as to a report of an engagement between me and a young lady named Marion Fay. I am sorry that her writing should be evidence that you are hardly yet strong enough to write yourself. I trust that it may not long be so. Would you wish to see me again at Trafford? I do not like to go there without the expression of a wish from you, but I hold myself in readiness to start whenever you may desire it. I had hoped from the last accounts that you were becoming stronger. 
I do not know how you may have heard anything of Marion Fay. Had I engaged myself to her or to any other young lady, I should have told you at once. I do not know whether a young man is supposed to declare his own failures in such matters, when he has failed, even to his father, but, as I am ashamed of nothing in the matter, I will avow that I have asked the young lady to be my wife, but she has as yet declined. I shall ask her again, and still hope to succeed. She is the daughter of a Mr. Fay who, as Lady Kingsbury says, is a Quaker, and is a clerk in a house in the city. As he is in all respects a good man, standing high for probity and honor among those who know him, I cannot think that there is any drawback. She, I think, has all the qualities which I would wish to find in the woman whom I might hope to make my wife. They live at number 17 Paradise Row, Holloway. Lady Kingsbury, indeed, is right in all her details. Pray let me have a line, if not from yourself, at any rate dictated by you, to say how you are. Your affectionate son, Hampstead. It was impossible to keep the letter from Lady Kingsbury. It thus became a recognized fact by the Marquis, by the Marchioness, and by Mr. Greenwood, that Hampstead was going to marry the Quaker's daughter. As to that pretense of a refusal, it went for nothing, even with the father. Was it probable that a Quaker's daughter, the daughter of a merchant's clerk out of the city, should refuse to become a marchioness? The sick man was obliged to express anger, having been already made to treat the report as incredible because of the disgrace which would accompany it, if true. Had he been left to himself, he would have endeavored to think as little about it as possible. Not to quarrel with his two eldest children was the wish that was now strongest at his heart. But his wife recalled the matter to him at each of the two daily visits which she made. "'What can I do?' he was driven to ask on the third morning. "'Mr. Greenwood suggests,' began his wife, not intending to irritate him, having really forgotten at the moment that no suggestion coming from Mr. Greenwood could be welcome to him. "'Damn Mr. Greenwood!' he shouted, lifting himself up erect from the pillows on his sofa. The Marchioness was in truth so startled by the violence of his movement and by the rage expressed on his haggard face that she jumped from her chair with unexpected surprise. "'I desire,' said the Marquis, that this man shall leave the house by the end of this month. End of section 31 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 32 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 10 King's Court, Old Broad Street Hampstead received the letter from Lady Kingsbury and answered it on Saturday, the 3rd of January, having at that time taken no active steps in regard to Marion Fay after the rejection of his suit on the day following Christmas. Eight days had thus elapsed, and he had done nothing. He had done nothing, though there was not an hour in the day in which he was not confirming his own resolve to do something by which he might make Marion Fay his own. He felt that he could hardly go to the girl again immediately after the expression of her resolution. At first he thought that he would write to her, and did sit down to the table for that purpose. But as he strove to produce words which might move her, he told himself that the words which he might speak would be better. Then he rode halfway to Holloway with the object of asking aid from Mrs. Roden. But he returned without completing his purpose, telling himself that any such aid, even if it could be obtained, would avail him nothing. In such a contest, if a man cannot succeed by his own doing, 
surely he will not do so by the assistance of any one else, and thus he was in doubt. After having written to Lady Kingsbury and his father, he reflected that, in his father's state of health, he ought to go again to Trafford Park. If it were only for a day or for an hour, he ought to see his father. He knew that he was not wanted by his stepmother. He knew also that no desire to see him had reached him from the Marquis. He was afraid that the Marquis himself did not wish to see him. It was almost impossible for him to take his sister to the house unless an especial demand for her attendance was made and he could not very well leave her alone for any lengthened period. Nevertheless, he determined to make a rapid run into Shropshire with the intention of returning the following day, unless he found the state of his father's health so bad as to make it expedient that he should remain. He intended to hunt on the Monday and the Tuesday, traveling from London to Leighton and back, but he would leave London by the night mail train from Paddington on Wednesday evening, so as to reach Trafford Park House on the following morning, between four and five. It was a journey which he had often made before in the same manner, and to which the servants at Trafford were well accustomed. Even at that time, in the morning, he would walk to the park from the station, which was four miles distant, leaving his luggage, if he had any, to be sent for on the following morning. But he would usually travel without luggage, having all things necessary for his use in his own room at Trafford. It had hitherto been his custom to acquaint his sister with his maneuvers on these occasions, having never been free in his correspondence with his stepmother. He had written or telegraphed to Lady Frances, and she had quite understood that his instructions, whatever they might be, were to be obeyed. But Lady Frances was no longer a resident at Trafford Park, and he therefore telegraphed to the old butler, who had been a servant in the family from a period previous to his own birth. This telegram he sent on the Monday, as follows. Shall be at Trafford Thursday morning, 4.30 a.m., We'll walk over. Let Dick be up. Have room ready. Tell my father. He fixed Wednesday night for his journey, having made up his mind to devote a portion of the Wednesday morning to the business which he had on hand in reference to Marion Fay. It was not the proper thing, he thought, to go to a girl's father for permission to ask the girl to be his wife before the girl had herself assented but the circumstances in this case were peculiar. It had seemed to him that Marion's only reason for rejecting him was based on disparity in their social condition, which to his thinking was the worst reason that could be given. It might be that the reason had sprung from some absurd idea originating with the Quaker father, or it might be that the Quaker father would altogether disapprove of any such reason. At any rate, he would be glad to know whether the old man was for him or against him, and, with the object of ascertaining this, he determined that he would pay a visit to the office in King's Court on the Wednesday morning. He could not endure the thought of leaving London, it might be for much more than the one day intended, without making some effort in regard to the object which was nearest his heart. Early in the day he walked into Messrs. Pogson and Littlebird's office, and saw Mr. Tribbledale seated on a high stool behind a huge desk, which nearly filled up the whole place. He was rather struck by the smallness and meanness of Messrs. Pogson and Littlebird's premises, which, from a certain nobility belonging to the Quaker's appearance, he would have thought to be spacious and important. It is impossible not to connect ideas after this fashion. Pogson and Littlebird themselves carried in their own names no flavor of commercial grandeur. Had they been only known to Hampstead by their name, any small mercantile retreat at the top of the meanest alley in the city might have sufficed for them. 
but there was something in the demeanor of Zachary Fay which seemed to give promise to one of those places of trade which are now being erected in every street and lane devoted in the city to business. Nothing could be less palatial than Pogson and Littlebird's counting-house. Hampstead had entered it from a little court, which it seemed to share with one other equally unimportant tenement opposite to it, by a narrow low passage. Here he saw two doors only, through one of which he passed, as it was open, having noticed that the word private was written on the other. Here he found himself face to face with Tribbledale, and with a little boy who sat at Tribbledale's right hand on a stool equally high. Of these two, as far as he could see, consisted the establishment of Messrs. Pogson and Littlebird. "'Could I see Mr. Fay?' asked Hampstead. "'Business?' suggested Tribbledale. "'Not exactly. That is to say, my business is private.' Then there appeared a face looking at him over a screen about five feet and a half high, which divided off from the small apartment a much smaller apartment, having, as Hampstead now regarded it, the appearance of a cage. In this cage, small as it was, there was a desk, and there were two chairs, and here Zachary Fay carried on the business of his life and transacted most of those affairs appertaining to Messrs. Pogson and Littlebird, which could be performed in an office. Messrs. Pogson and Littlebird themselves, though they had a room of their own, to which that door marked private, belonged, were generally supposed to be walking on change, as British merchants should do, or making purchases of whole ship's cargoes in the docks, or discounting bills, the least of which would probably represent ten thousand pounds. The face which looked over the barrier of the cage at Lord Hampstead was, of course, that of Zachary Fay. "'Lord Hampstead,' he said, with surprise. "'Oh, Mr. Fay, how do you do? I have something I want to say to you. Could you spare me five minutes?' The Quaker opened the door of the cage and asked Lord Hampstead to walk in. Tribbledale, who had heard and recognized the name, stared hard at the young nobleman, at his friend Crocker's noble friend, at the lord of whom it had been asserted positively that he was engaged to marry Mr. Fay's daughter. The boy, too, having heard that the visitor was a lord, stared also. Hampstead did as he was bid, but remembering that the inhabitant of the cage had at once heard what had been said in the office, felt that it would be impossible for him to carry on his conversation about Marion without other protection from the ears of the world. "'It is a little private, what I have to say,' remarked Hampstead. The Quaker looked towards the private room. "'Old Mr. Pogson is there,' whispered Tribbledale. I heard him come in a quarter of an hour ago. "'Perhaps thou wouldst not mind walking up and down the yard,' said the Quaker. Hampstead, of course, walked out, but on looking about him found that the court was very small for the communication which he had to make. Space would be required, so that he might not be troubled by turning when he was in the midst of his eloquence. Half a dozen steps would carry him the whole length of King's Court, and who could tell his love story in a walk limited to six steps? "'Perhaps we might go out into the street?' he suggested. "'Certainly, my lord,' said the Quaker. "'Tribbledale, should any one call before I return, and be unable to wait for five minutes, I shall be found outside the court.' not above fifty yards, either to the right or to the left. Hampstead thus limited to a course not exceeding a hundred yards in one of the most crowded thoroughfares of the city, began the execution of his difficult task. "'Mr. Fay,' he said, "'are you aware of what has passed between me and your daughter Marion?' "'Hardly, my lord. "'Has she told you nothing of it?' Yea, my lord, she has in truth told me much. 
She has told me, no doubt, all that it behoves a father to hear from a daughter in such circumstances. I live on such terms with my Marion that there are not many secrets kept by either of us from the other. Then you do know? I know that your lordship tendered to her your hand, honestly, nobly, and truly, as I take it. With perfect honesty and perfect truth, most certainly. And I know also that she declined the honor thus offered her. She did. Is this you, Zachary? How are you this morning? This came from a stout, short, red-faced man who stopped them, standing in the middle of the pavement. Well, I thank thee, Mr. Grooby. At this moment I am particularly engaged. That is Jonathan Grooby, said the Quaker to his companion, as soon as the stout man had walked on. One of the busiest men in the city. You have heard, probably, of Grooby and Inderwald? Hampstead had never heard of Grooby and Inderwald, and wished that the stout man had been minding his business at that moment. But as to Miss Fay, he said, endeavoring to continue to tell his love story. Yes, as to Marion. I hardly do know what passed between you two, not having heard the reasons she gave thee. No reasons at all, nothing worth speaking of between persons who know anything of the world. Did she tell thee that she did not love thee, my lord? Because that, to my thinking, would be reason enough. Nothing of the kind. I don't mean to boast, but I don't see why she should not like me well enough. Nor in sooth do I either. What, Zachary, you walking about at this busy time of the day? I am walking about, Sir Thomas. It is not customary with me, but I am walking about. Then he turned on his heel, moved almost to dudgeon by the interruption, and walk the other way. Sir Thomas Bolster, my lord, a very busy sort of gentleman, but one who has done well in the world. Nor in sooth do I either, but this is a matter in which a young maiden must decide for herself. I shall not bid her not to love thee, but I cannot bid her to do so. It isn't that, Mr. Fay. Of course I have no right to pretend to any regard from her, but as to that there has been no question. What did she say to thee? Some trash about rank. Nay, my lord, it is not trash. I cannot hear thee speak so of thine own order without contradiction. Am I to be like a king in the old days who was forced to marry any ugly old princess that might be found for him, even though she were odious to him? I will have nothing to do with rank on such terms. I claim the right to please myself, as do other men. And I come to you as father to the young lady to ask from you your assistance in winning her to be my wife. At this moment up came Tribbledale, running from the office. "'There is Cook there,' said Tribbledale, with much emphasis in his voice, as though Cook's was a very serious affair. "'From Pollock and Austin's.' "'Is not Mr. Pogson within?' "'He went out just after you. Cook says that it's most important that he should see someone immediately. "'Tell him that he must wait yet five minutes longer.' said Zachary Fay, frowning. Tribbledale, awestruck as he bethought himself how great were the affairs of Pollock and Austin, retreated back hurriedly to the court. "'You know what I mean, Mr. Fay,' continued Lord Hampstead. "'I know well what thou meanest, my lord. I think I know what thou meanest. Thou meanest to offer to my girl not only high rank and great wealth, but, which should be of infinitely more value to her, the heart and the hand of an honest man. I believe thee to be an honest man, my lord. In this matter, Mr. Fay, at any rate, I am. In all matters as I believe, and how should I, being such a one as I am, not be willing to give my girl to such a suitor as thee? And what is it now? 
he shrieked in his anger as the little boy off the high stool came rushing to him. Mr. Pogson has just come back, Mr. Fay, and he says that he can't find those letters from Pollock and Austin anywhere about the place. He wants them immediately because he can't tell the prices named without seeing them. Lord Hampstead, said the Quaker, almost white with rage, I must pray thee to excuse me for five minutes. Hampstead promised that he would confine himself to the same uninteresting plot of ground till the Quaker should return to him, and then reflected that there were certain reasons upon which he had not calculated against falling in love with the daughter of a city clerk. "'We will go a little further afield,' said the Quaker, when he returned, "'so that we may not be troubled again by those imbeciles in the court.' It is little, however, that I have to say to thee further. Thou hast my leave. I am glad of that, and all my sympathies. But, my lord, I suppose I had better tell the truth. Oh, certainly. My girl fears that her health may fail her. Her health? It is that, as I think. She has not said so to me openly, but I think it is that. Her mother died early, and her brothers and her sisters. It is a sad tale, my lord. But need that hinder her? I think not, my lord, but it must be for thee to judge. As far as I know, she is as fit to become a man's wife as are other girls. Her health has not failed her. She is not robust, but she does her work in looking after my household, such as it is, well and punctually. I think that her mind is pervaded with vain terrors. Now I have told thee all, placing full confidence in thee as in an honest man. There is my house. Thou art welcome to go there if it seemeth thee good, and to deal with Marian in this matter as thy love and thy judgment may direct thee. Having said this, he returned hurriedly to King's Court, as though he feared that Tribbledale or the boy might again find him out. So far Hampstead had succeeded, but he was much troubled in his mind by what he had heard as to Marion's health. Not that it occurred to him for a moment that such a marriage as he contemplated would be undesirable, because his Marion might become ill, he was too thoroughly in love to entertain such an idea. Nor is it one which can find ready entrance into the mind of a young man who sees a girl blooming with the freshness and beauty of youth. It would have seemed to him, had he thought about it at all, that Marion's health was perfect. But he was afraid of her obstinacy, and he felt that this objection might be more binding on her than that which she put forward in reference to his rank. He went back, therefore, to Hendon Hall, only half satisfied, sometimes elated, but sometimes depressed. He would, however, go and discuss the matter with her at full length as soon as he should have returned from Shropshire. He would remain there only for one day, though it might be necessary for him to repeat the journey almost immediately, so that no time might be lost in using his eloquence upon Marion. After what had passed between him and the Quaker, he thought that he was almost justified in assuring himself that the girl did, in truth, love him. "'Give my father my kindest love,' said Lady Frances, as her brother was about to start for the train. "'Of course I will.' "'And tell him that I will start at a moment's notice whenever he may wish to see me.' "'In such a case, of course, I should take you.' and be courteous to her if you can. I doubt whether she will allow me. If she abuses you or insults me, I must answer her. I wouldn't. You would be more ready than I am. One cannot but answer her because she expects to hear something said in return. I shall keep out of her way as much as possible. I shall have my breakfast brought to me in my own room to-morrow, and shall then remain with my father as much as possible. If I leave him at all, I shall get a walk. There will only be the dinner. 
as to one thing I have quite made up my mind. Nothing shall drive me into having any words with Mr. Greenwood, unless, indeed, my father were to ask me to speak to him. End of section 32 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 33 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 11. Mr. Greenwood Becomes Ambitious. Mr. Greenwood was still anxious as to the health of the rector of Apple Slocum. There might even yet be a hope for him but his chance, he thought, would be better with the present Marquis, ill-disposed towards him as the Marquis was, than with the heir. The Marquis was weary of him, and anxious to get rid of him, was acting very meanly to him, as Mr. Greenwood thought, having offered him one thousand pounds as a final payment for a whole life's attention. The Marquis, who had ever been a liberal man, had now perhaps on his deathbed, become unjust, harsh, and cruel. But he was weak and forgetful, and might possibly be willing to save his money and get rid of the nuisance of the whole affair by surrendering the living. This was Mr. Greenwood's reading of the circumstances as they at present existed. But the Marquis could not dispose of the living while the rector was still alive nor could he even promise it to any good effect without his son's assent. That Lord Hampstead would neither himself so bestow his patronage or allow it to be so bestowed, Mr. Greenwood was very sure. There had been that between him and Lord Hampstead which convinced him that the young man was more hostile to him even than the father. The Marquis, as Mr. Greenwood thought, had insulted him of late, but Lord Hampstead, young as he was, had also been insolent, and what was worse, he had insulted Lord Hampstead. There had been something in the young lord's eye which had assured him of the young lord's contempt as well as dislike. If anything could be done about the living, it must be done by the Marquis. The Marquis was very ill, but it was still probable that the old rector should die first. He had been given to understand that the old rector could hardly live many weeks. Mr. Greenwood understood but little of the young lord's character. The Marquis, no doubt, he knew well, having lived with him for many years. When he supposed his patron to be fretful and irascible because of his infirmities, but to be by nature forgiving, unreasonable, and weak, he drew an easy portrait which was like the person portrayed. But in attributing revenge or harshness or pride of power to Lord Hampstead, he was altogether wrong. As regarded Appleslocombe and other parishes, the patronage of which would some day belong to him, Lord Hampstead had long since made up his mind that he would have nothing to do with them, feeling himself unfit to appoint clergymen to ministrations in a church to which he did not consider himself to belong. All that he would leave to the bishop, thinking that the bishop must know more about it than himself. Was his father, however, to make any request to him with reference to Apple Slocombe especially? he would no doubt regard the living as bestowed before his father's death. But of all this Mr. Greenwood could understand nothing. He felt, however, that as the Marquis had given him cause for anger, so had the young lord given him cause for hatred as well as anger. Daily, almost hourly, these matters were discussed between Lady Kingsbury and the chaplain. There had come to be strong sympathy between them, as far as sympathy can exist, where the feelings are much stronger on the one side than on the other. The mother of the darlings had allowed herself to inveigh very bitterly against her husband's children by his former marriage, 
and at first had been received only halfway by her confidential friend. But of late her confidential friend had become more animated and more bitter than herself, and had almost startled her by the boldness of his denunciations. She, in her passion, had allowed herself more than once to express a wish that her stepson were dead. She had hardly in truth meant as much as she implied, or, meaning it, had hardly thought of what she meant. But the chaplain, taking the words from her lips, had repeated them till she was almost terrified by their iniquity and horror. He had no darlings to justify him. No great injury had been done to him by an unkind fortune. Great as were the sin of Lord Hampstead and his sister, they could bring no disgrace upon him. And yet there was a settled purpose of hatred in his words which frightened her. Though she could not bring herself to oppose them, she in her rage had declared that it would be well that Lord Hampstead should break his neck out hunting, or go down in his yacht at sea and she had been gratified to find that her friend had sanctioned her ill wishes. But when Mr. Greenwood spoke as though something might possibly be done to further those wishes, then she almost repented herself. She had been induced to say that if any power should come to her of bestowing the living of Apple Slocum, she would bestow it on Mr. Greenwood. Were Lord Hampstead to die before the Marquis, and were the Marquis to die before the old rector, such power would belong to her during the minority of her eldest son. There had, therefore, been some meaning in the promise, and the clergyman had referred to it more than once or twice. "'It is most improbable, you know, Mr. Greenwood,' she had said very seriously. He had replied as seriously that such improbabilities were of frequent occurrence. If it should happen, I will do so, she had answered. But after that she had never of her own accord referred to the probability of Lord Hampstead's death. From day to day there grew upon her a feeling that she had subjected herself to domination, almost to tyranny, from Mr. Greenwood. The man whom she had known intimately during her entire married life now appeared to assume different proportions and almost a different character. He would still stand before her with his flabby hands hanging listlessly by his side, and with eyes apparently full of hesitation, and would seem to tremble as though he feared the effect of his own words. But still the words that fell from him were felt to be bonds from which she could not escape. When he looked at her from his lackluster eyes, fixing them upon her for minutes together, till the minutes seemed to be hours, she became afraid. She did not confess to herself that she had fallen into his power. Nor did she realize the fact that it was so. But without realizing it she was dominated, so that she also began to think that it would be well that the chaplain should be made to leave Trafford Park. He, however, continued to discuss with her all family matters as though his services were indispensable to her, and she was unable to answer him in such a way as to reject his confidences. The telegram reached the butler as to Hampstead's coming on the Monday, and was, of course, communicated at once to Lord Kingsbury. The Marquis, who was now confined to his bed, expressed himself as greatly gratified and himself told the news to his wife. She, however, had already heard it, as had also the chaplain. It quickly went through the whole household, in which, among the servants, there existed an opinion that Lord Hampstead ought to have been again sent for some days since. The doctor had hinted as much to the marchioness, and had said so plainly to the butler. Mr. Greenwood had expressed to her ladyship his belief that the Marquis had no desire to see his son, and that the son certainly had no wish to pay another visit to Trafford. "'He cares more about the Quaker's daughter than anything else,' he had said, "'about her and his hunting.' 
he and his sister consider themselves as separated from the whole of the family i should leave them alone if i were you then she had said a faint word to her husband and had extracted from him something that was supposed to be the expression of a wish that lord hampstead should not be disturbed now lord hampstead was coming without any invitation going to walk over is he in the middle of the night said mr greenwood preparing to discuss the matter with the marchioness there was something of scorn in his voice as though he were taking upon himself to laugh at lord hampstead for having chosen this way of reaching his father's house he often does that said the marchioness it's an odd way of coming into a sick house to disturb it in the middle of the night mr greenwood as he spoke stood looking at her ladyship severely how am i to help it i don't suppose anybody will be disturbed at all he'll come round to the side door and one of the servants will be up to let him in he always does things differently from anybody else one would have thought that when his father was dying don't say that mr greenwood there's nothing to make you say that the marquis is very ill but nobody has said that he's so bad as that mr greenwood shook his head but did not move from the position in which he was standing i suppose that on this occasion hampstead is doing what is right i doubt whether he ever does what is right i am only thinking that if anything should happen to the marquis how very bad it would be for you and the young lords won't you sit down mr greenwood said the marchioness to whom the presence of the standing chaplain had become almost intolerable the man sat down not comfortably in his chair but hardly more than on the edge of it so as still to have that air of restraint which had annoyed his companion as i was saying if anything should happen to my lord it would be very sad for your ladyship and for lord frederick and lord augustus and lord gregory we are all in the hands of god said her ladyship piously yes we are all in the hands of god but it is the lord's intention that we should all look out for ourselves and do the best we can to avoid injustice and cruelty and and robbery i do not think there will be any robbery mr greenwood would it not be robbery if you and their little lordships should be turned at once out of this house it would be his own lord hampstead's of course and i should have slocum abbey in somersetshire as far as a house goes i should like it better than this of course it is much smaller but what comfort do i ever have out of a house like this that's true enough but why there is no good in talking about it mr greenwood i cannot help talking about it it is because lady frances has broken up the family by allowing herself to be engaged to a young man beneath her own station in life here he shook his head as he always did when he spoke of lady frances as for lord hampstead i look upon it as a national misfortune that he should outlive his father what can we do well my lady it is hard to say what will my feelings be should anything happen to the marquis and should i be left to the tender mercies of his eldest son i should have no claim upon lord hampstead for a shilling as he is an infidel of course he would not want a chaplain indeed i could not reconcile it to my conscience to remain with him i should be cast out penniless having devoted all my life as i may say to his lordship's service he has offered you a thousand pounds a thousand pounds for the labors of a whole life and what assurance shall i have of that i don't suppose he has ever dreamed of putting it into his will and if he has what will a thousand pounds do for me you can go to slocum abbey 
but the rectory, which was as good as promised, will be closed against me. The Marchioness knew that this was a falsehood, but did not dare to tell him so. The living had been talked about between them, till it was assumed that he had a right to it. If the young man were out of the way, he continued, there would be some chance for me. I cannot put him out of the way, said the Marchioness. And some chance for Lord Frederick and his brothers. You need not tell me of that, Mr. Greenwood. But one has to look the truth in the face. It is for your sake that I have been anxious, rather than my own. You must own that. She would not own anything of the kind. I suppose there was no doubt about the first marriage? None at all, said the Marchioness, terrified. Though it was thought very odd at the time, it ought to be looked to, I think. No stone ought to be left unturned. There is nothing to be hoped for in that direction, Mr. Greenwood. It ought to be looked to, that's all. Only think what it will be if he marries and has a son before anything is, is settled. To this Lady Kingsbury made no answer, and after a pause Mr. Greenwood turned to his own grievances. I shall make bold, he said to see the Marquis once again before Lord Hampstead comes down. He cannot but acknowledge that I have a great right to be anxious. I do not suppose that any promise would be sacred in his son's eyes, but I must do the best I can. To this her ladyship would make no answer, and they parted, not in the best humor with each other. That was on the Monday. On the Tuesday, Mr. Greenwood, having asked to be allowed an interview, crept slowly into the sick man's room. "'I hope your lordship find yourself better this morning?' The sick man turned in his bed and only made some feeble grunt in reply. "'I hear that Lord Hampstead is coming down tomorrow, my lord.' "'Why should he not come?' There must have been something in the tone of Mr. Greenwood's voice which had grated against the sick man's ears, or he would not have answered so sulkily. "'Oh, no, my lord, I did not mean to say that there was any reason why his lordship should not come. Perhaps it might have been better had he come earlier.' "'It wouldn't have been better at all.' "'I only just meant to make the remark, my lord. There was nothing in it.' "'Nothing at all,' said the sick man. "'Was there anything else you wished to say, Mr. Greenwood?' The nurse all this time was sitting in the room, which the chaplain felt to be uncomfortable. "'Could we be alone for a few minutes, my lord?' he asked. "'I don't think we could,' said the sick man. "'There are a few points which are of so much importance to me, Lord Kingsbury.' I ain't well enough to talk business, and I won't do it. Mr. Roberts will be here tomorrow, and you can see him. Mr. Roberts was a man of business, or agent to the property, who lived at Shrewsbury, and whom Mr. Greenwood especially disliked. Mr. Greenwood, being a clergyman, was, of course, supposed to be a gentleman, and regarded Mr. Roberts as being much beneath himself. It was not customary for Mr. Roberts to dine at the house, and he was therefore regarded by the chaplain as being hardly more than an upper servant. It was therefore very grievous to him to be told that he must discuss his own private affairs and make his renewed request as to the living through Mr. Roberts. It was evidently intended that he should have no opportunity of discussing his private affairs. Whatever the Marquis might offer him, he must take, and that, as far as he could see, without any power of redress on his side. If Mr. Roberts were to offer him a thousand pounds, he could only accept the check and depart with it from Trafford Park, shaking off from his feet the dust which such ingratitude would forbid him to carry with him. He was in the habit of walking daily for an hour before sunset, 
moving very slowly up and down the driest of the roads near the house, generally with his hands clasped behind his back, believing that in doing so he was consulting his health and maintaining that bodily vigor which might be necessary to him for the performance of the parochial duties at Apple Slocombe. Now, when he had left the bedroom of the Marquis, he went out of the front door, and proceeded on his walk at a somewhat quicker pace than usual. He was full of wrath, and his passion gave some alacrity to his movements. He was, of course, incensed against the Marquis, but his anger burnt hottest against Lord Hampstead. In this he was altogether unreasonable, for Lord Hampstead had said nothing and done nothing that could injure his position. Lord Hampstead disliked him, and perhaps despised him, but had been anxious that the Marquis should be liberal in the mode of severing a connection which had lasted so long. But to Mr. Greenwood himself it was manifest that all his troubles came from the iniquities of his patron's two elder children, and he remembered at every moment that Lord Hampstead had insulted him when they were both together. He was certainly not a man to forgive an enemy, or to lose any opportunity for revenge which might come in his way. Certainly it would be good if the young man could be got to break his neck out hunting, or good if the yacht could be made to founder, or go to pieces on a rock, or come to any other fatal maritime misfortune. But these were accidents which he personally could have no power to produce. Such wishing was infantine and fit only for a weak woman such as the Marchioness. If anything were to be done, it must be done by some great endeavor, and the endeavor must come from himself. Then he reflected how far the Marchioness would certainly be in his power if both the Marquis and his elder son were dead. He did believe that he had obtained great influence over her, that she should rebel against him was, of course, on the cards. But he was aware that within the last month, since the date, indeed, at which the Marquis had threatened to turn him out of the house, he had made considerable progress in imposing himself upon her as a master. He gave himself, in this respect, much more credit than was in truth due to him. Lady Kingsbury, though she had learnt to fear him, had not so subjected herself to his influence as not to be able to throw him off, should a time come at which it might be essential to her comfort to do so. But he had misread the symptoms, and had misread also the fretfulness of her impatience. He now assured himself that if anything could be done he might rely entirely on her support. After all that she had said to him, it would be impossible that she should throw him over. Thinking of all this, and thinking also how expedient it was that something should be done, he returned to the house when he had taken the exact amount of exercise which he supposed necessary for his health. End of section 33 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 34 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 12. Like the Poor Cat in the Adage. Wishing will do nothing. If a man has sufficient cause for action, he should act. Letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage, never can produce results. Cherries will not fall into your mouth without picking. If it were done when tis done, then twere well that it were done quickly. If grapes hang too high, what is the use of thinking of them? Nevertheless, where there's a will, there's a way. But certainly no way will be found amidst difficulties unless a man set himself to work seriously to look for it. With such self-given admonitions, counsels, and tags of old quotations as these, Mr. Greenwood went to work with himself on Monday night, 
and came to a conclusion that if anything were to be done, it must be done at once. Then came the question, what was the thing to be done, and what at once meant? When a thing has to be done which requires a special summoning of resolution, it is too often something which ought not to be done. To virtuous deeds, if they recommend themselves to us at all, we can generally make up our minds more easily. It was pleasanter to Mr. Greenwood to think of the thing as something in the future, as something which might possibly get itself done for him by accident, than as an act the doing of which must fall into his own hands. Then came the cat in the adage, and the when tis done then twere well, and the rest of it. Thursday morning between four and five o'clock, when it would be pitch dark, with neither star nor moon in the heavens, when Lord Hampstead would certainly be alone in a certain spot, unattended and easily assailable, would Thursday morning be the fittest time for any such deed as that which he had now in truth began to contemplate? When the thing presented itself to him in this new form, he recoiled from it. It cannot be said that Mr. Greenwood was a man of any strong religious feelings. He had been ordained early in life to a curacy, having probably followed, in choosing his profession, the bent given to him by his family connections, and had thus from circumstances fallen into the household of his present patron's uncle. From that to this he had never performed a service in a church, and his domestic services as chaplain had very soon become nothing. The old Lord Kingsbury had died very soon afterwards, and Mr. Greenwood's services had been continued rather as private secretary and librarian than as domestic chaplain. He had been crafty, willing, and though anxious, he had been able to conceal his anxiety in that respect, and ready to obey when he found it necessary. In this manner he had come to his present condition of life, and had but few of the manners or feelings of a clergyman about him. He was quite willing to take a living if it should come in his way, but to take it with a purpose that the duties should be chiefly performed by a curate. He was not a religious man, but when he came to look the matter in the face, not on that account could he regard himself as a possible murderer without terrible doubts. As he thought of it, his first and prevailing fear did not come from the ignominious punishment which is attached to, and which generally attends, the crime. He has been described as a man, flabby in appearance, as one who seemed to tremble in his shoes when called upon for any special words, as one who might be supposed to be devoid of strong physical daring. But the true character of the man was opposed to his outward bearing. Courage is a virtue of too high a nature to be included among his gifts. But he had that command of his own nerves, that free action of blood round his heart, that personal audacity coming from self-confidence, which is often taken to represent courage. Given the fact that he wanted an enemy out of the way, he could go to work to prepare to put him out of the way without exaggerated dread of the consequences as far as this world is concerned. He trusted much in himself, and thought it possible that he could so look through all the concomitant incidents of such an act as that he had contemplated, without allowing one to escape him which might lead to detection. He could so look at the matter, he thought, as to be sure whether this or the other plot might or might not be safe. It might be that no safe plot were possible, and that the attempt must therefore be abandoned. These, at any rate, were not the dangers which made him creep about in dismay at his own intentions. There were other dangers of which he could not shake off the dread. Whether he had any clear hope as to eternal bliss in another life, it may be doubted. He probably drove from his mind thoughts on the subject, not caring to investigate his own belief. 
It is the practice of many to have their minds utterly callous in that respect. To suppose that such men think this or think the other as to future rewards and punishments is to give them credit for a condition of mind to which they have never risen. Such a one was probably Mr. Greenwood. But nevertheless he feared something when this idea respecting Lord Hampstead presented itself to him. It was as is some bogey-bow to a child, some half-belief in a spectre to a nervous woman, some dread of undefined evil to an imaginative but melancholy man. He did not think that by meditating such a deed, by hardening his heart to the necessary resolution, by stealing himself up to its perpetration, he would bring himself into a condition unfitted for a life of bliss. His thoughts did not take any such direction. But though there might be no punishment in this world, even though there were to be no other world in which punishment could come, still something of evil would surely fall upon him. The convictions of the world since the days of Cain have all gone in that direction. It was thus that he allowed himself to be cowed, and to be made to declare to himself again and again that the project must be abandoned. But the cat in the adage succeeded so far on the Tuesday in getting the better of his scruples that he absolutely did form a plot. He did not as yet quite see his way to that security which would be indispensable, but he did form a plot. Then came the bitter reflection that what he would do would be done for the benefit of others rather than his own. What would Lord Frederick know of his benefactor when he should come to the throne, as in such case he would do, as Marquis of Kingsbury? Lord Frederick would give him no thanks, even were he to know it, which of course could never be the case. And why had not that woman assisted him, she who had instigated him to the doing of the deed? For Banquo's issue have I filed my mind, he said to himself over and over again, not, however, in truth thinking of the deed with any of the true remorse to which Macbeth was a prey. The filing of his mind only occurred to him because the words were otherwise apt. Would she even be grateful when she should tell herself, as surely she would, that the deed had been done by the partner of her confidences? When he thought of the reward which was to come to him in payment of the intended deed, something like a feeling of true conscience did arise within him. Might it not be the case that even he, callous as he was to most things, should find himself unable to go down to Apple Slocum and read himself in, as the phrase goes, as rector and pastor of the parish? He thought of this as he lay in his bed, and acknowledged to himself that his own audacity would probably be insufficient to carry him through such a struggle. But still, on the morning when he rose, he had not altogether rejected the idea. The young man had scorned him, and had insulted him, and was hateful to him. But still, why should he be the Macbeth, seeing that the Lady Macbeth of the occasion was untrue to him? In all this he was unaware how very little his Lady Macbeth had really meant when she had allowed herself, in his presence, to express wishes as to her stepson's death. He thought he saw his plan. The weapon was there ready to his hand. A weapon which he had not bought, which could not be traced to him, which would certainly be fatal if used with the assurance of which he was confident. And there would be ample time for retreat. But still, as he arranged it all in his mind, he regarded it all not as a thing fixed, but as a thing which was barely possible. It was thus that it might be done, had the Lady Macbeth of the occasion really shown herself competent to such a task. Why should he trouble himself on such a matter? Why should he file his mind for Banquo's issue? Yet he looked at the pistol and at the window as he prepared to go up to her ladyship's room before lunch on the Wednesday morning. It certainly could be done, he said to himself, 
telling himself at the same time that all that had been passing in his own mind was no more than a vague speculation. A man is apt to speculate on things which have no reality to him till they become real. He had assumed the practice of going to her ladyship's sitting-room upstairs without a special summons, latterly to her ladyship's great disgust. When her quarrel had first become strong with Lady Frances, she had no doubt received comfort from his support. But now she had become weary of him, and had sometimes been almost dismayed by the words he spoke to her. At half-past twelve punctually she went down to her husband's room, and it was now customary with the chaplain to visit her before she did so. She had more than once almost resolved to tell him that she preferred to be left alone during the morning. But she had not as yet assumed the courage to do this. She was aware that words had fallen from her in her anger, which it was possible he might use against her were she to subject herself to his displeasure. "'Lord Hampstead will be here at half-past four, what you may call the middle of the night, tomorrow morning, Lady Kingsbury,' said he, repeating an assertion which he had already made to her two or three times. As he did so, he stood in the middle of the room, looking down upon her with a gaze under which she had often suffered, but which she did not in the least understand.' "'Of course I know he's coming.' "'Don't you think it a very improper time, with a sick man in the house?' "'He won't disturb his father.' "'I don't know. There will be the opening and the shutting of the door, and the servant will be going about the passages, and there will be the bringing in of the luggage.' "'He won't have any luggage.' Mr. Greenwood had been aware of this, but it might be well that he should affect ignorance. "'It is like everything else that he does,' he said, being anxious to induce the stepmother to speak ill of her stepson. But the bent of her mind had been turned. She was not conscious of the cause which had produced the change, but she was determined to speak no further evil of her stepchildren before Mr. Greenwood. "'I suppose there is nothing to be done?' said Mr. Greenwood. "'What should there be to be done? If you do remain here, I wish you would sit down, Mr. Greenwood. You oppress me by standing up in that way in the middle of the room.' "'I do not wonder that you should be oppressed,' he said, seating himself, as was his wont, on the edge of a chair. "'I am oppressed, I know. No one ever says a word to comfort me.' What am I to do if anything should happen? Mr. Greenwood, what is the use of all this? What would you think, Lady Kingsbury, if you had to live all the rest of your life on an income arising from a thousand pounds? It isn't my fault. What's the good of your coming to me with all that? I have had nothing to do with the arrangement which Lord Kingsbury has made with you. You know very well that I do not dare even to mention your name to him, lest he should order that you should be turned out of the house. Turned out of the house? he said, jumping off his chair on to his legs with an alacrity which was quite unusual to him. Turned out of the house? As if I were a dog? No man alive would stand such language. You know very well that I've always stood your friend, said the marchioness, alarmed by the man's impetuosity. "'And you tell me that I'm to be turned out of the house?' "'I only say that it would be better not to mention your name to him. I must go now, because he will be waiting for me.' "'He doesn't care a straw for you, not a straw.' "'Mr. Greenwood.' "'He cares only for his son and daughter, for the son and daughter of his first wife.' for those two ignoble young persons who, as you have said so often, are altogether unworthy of their name. Mr. Greenwood, I cannot admit this. Have you not said it over and over again? Have you not declared how good a thing it would be that Lord Hampstead should die? You cannot go back from all that, Lady Kingsbury. I must go now, Mr. Greenwood, she said 
shuffling out of the room. He had altogether frightened her, and as she went downstairs she determined that at whatever cost she must save herself from further private conversation with the chaplain. Mr. Greenwood, when he was thus left alone, did not at once leave the room. He had reseated himself, and there he remained still gazing as though there had been someone for him to gaze at, and still seated on the edge of his chair as though there were someone to see the affected humility of his position. But in truth the gazing and the manner of sitting had become so customary to him that they were assumed without thought. His mind was now full of the injury done to him by the marchioness. She had made him her confidant. She had poured her secret thoughts into his ears. She had done her best to inspire him with her hatred and her desires. And now, when she had almost taught him to be the minister of her wishes, she turned upon him and upbraided him and deserted him. Of course, when he had sympathized with her as to her ill-used darlings, he had expected her to sympathize with him as to the hardships inflicted upon him. But she cared nothing for his hardships, and was anxious to repudiate the memory of all the hard words which she had spoken as to her husband's children. It should not be so. She should not escape from him in this manner. When confidences have been made, the persons making them must abide the consequences. When a partnership has been formed, neither partner has a right to retreat at once, leaving the burden of all debts upon the other. Had not all these thoughts and plottings which had been so heavy on his mind since that telegram had come, which had been so heavy on his soul, been her doing? Had not the idea come from her? had there not been an unspoken understanding between them that in consequence of certain mutual troubles and mutual aspirations there should be a plan of action arranged between them? Now she was deserting him. Well, he thought that he could so contrive things that she should not do so with impunity. Having considered all this, he got up from his chair and slowly walked down to his own room. He lunched by himself, and then sat himself down with a novel, as was his wont at that hour of the day. There could be no man more punctual in all his daily avocations than Mr. Greenwood. After lunch there always came the novel, but there was seldom much of it read. He would generally go to sleep, and would remain so, enjoying perfect tranquillity for the best part of an hour. Then he would go out for his constitutional walk, after which he would again take up the novel till the time came for her ladyship's tea. On this occasion he did not read at all, but neither did he at once sleep. There had been that on his mind which, even though it had not been perfected, banished sleep from him for some minutes. There was no need of any further conversation as to safety or danger. The deed, whether it would or could not have been done in the manner he had premeditated, certainly would not be done now. Certainly not now would he file his mind for Banquo's issue. But after half an hour of silent meditation he did sleep. When he arose and went out for a walk, he felt that his heart was light within him. He had done nothing by which he had compromised himself, he had bound himself to no deed. As he walked up and down the road, he assured himself that he had never really thought of doing it. He had only speculated as to the probability, which is so common for men to do as to performances which they had no thought of attempting. There was a great burden gone from him. Had he desired to get rid of Lord Hampstead, it was in that way that he would have done it and he would so have done it that he would never have been suspected of the deed. He had never intended more than that. As he returned to the house he assured himself that he had never intended anything more, and yet there was a great burden gone from him. At five o'clock a message was brought to him that her ladyship, 
finding herself to be rather unwell, begged to be excused from asking him up to tea. The message was brought by the butler himself, with a suggestion that he should have tea in his own room. "'I think I will, Harris,' he said. "'Just take a cup. By the by, Harris, have you seen my lord to-day?' Harris declared that he had seen his lordship, in a tone of voice which implied that he, at any rate, had not been banished from my lord's presence. "'And how do you find him?' Harris thought that the Marquis was a little more like himself to-day than he had been for the last three days. "'That's right. I am very glad to hear that. Lord Hampstead's coming to-morrow will be a great comfort to him.' "'Yes, indeed,' said Harris, who was quite on Lord Hampstead's side in the family quarrels. He had not been pleased with the idea of the Roden marriage, which certainly was unfortunate for the daughter of a Marquess, but he was by no means inclined to take part against the heir to the family honours. "'I wish he were coming at a little more reasonable hour in the day,' said Mr. Greenwood, with a smile." but Harris thought that the time of the day would do very well. It was the kind of thing which his lordship very often did, and Harris did not see any harm in it. This Harris said with his hand on the lock of the door, showing that he was not anxious for a prolonged conversation with the chaplain. End of section 34 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 35 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 13. Lady Frances Sees Her Lover. On the Monday in that week, Monday the 5th of January, on which day Hampstead had been hunting and meditating the attack which he subsequently made on Zachary Fay, in king's court mrs vincent had paid a somewhat unusually long visit in paradise row as the visit was always made on monday neither had clara demijohn or mrs duffer been very much surprised but still it had been observed that the brougham had been left at the duchess of edinburgh for an hour beyond the usual time and a few remarks were made she is so punctual about her time generally clara had said but mrs duffer remarked that as she had exceeded the hour usually devoted to her friend's company she had probably found it quite as well to stay another they don't make half hours in any of those yards you know said mrs duffer and so the matter had been allowed to pass as having been sufficiently explained but there had, in truth, been more than that in Mrs. Vincent's prolonged visit to her cousin. There had been much to be discussed, and the discussion led to a proposition made that evening by Mrs. Roden to her son, by which the latter was much surprised. She was desirous of starting almost immediately for Italy, and was anxious that he should accompany her. If it were to be so, he was quite alive to the expediency of going with her. "'But what is it, mother?' he asked, when she had requested his attendance without giving the cause which rendered the journey necessary. Then she paused, as though considering whether she would comply with his request and tell him that whole secret of his life which she had hitherto concealed from him. "'Of course I will not press you,' he said if you think that you cannot trust me. Oh, George, that is unkind. What else am I to say? Is it possible that I should start suddenly upon such a journey, or that I should see you doing so, without asking the reason why? Or can I suppose, if you do not tell me, but that there is some reason why you should not trust me? You know I trust you. No mother ever trusted a son more implicitly. You ought to know that. It is not a matter of trusting. There may be secrets to which a person shall be so pledged that she cannot tell them to her dearest friend. If I had made a promise, 
would you not have me keep it? Promises such as that should not be exacted, and should not be made. But if they have been exacted, and have been made, do as I ask you now, and it is probable that everything will be clear to you before we return, or at any rate as clear to you as it is to me. After this, with a certain spirit of reticence which was peculiar with him, he made up his mind to do as his mother would have him without asking further questions. He set himself to work immediately to make the necessary arrangements for his journey with as much apparent satisfaction as though it were to be done on his own behalf. It was decided that they would start on the next Friday, travel through France, and by the tunnel of the Mont Cenis to Turin, and thence on to Milan. Of what further there was to befall them he knew nothing at this period. It was necessary in the first place that he should get leave of absence from Sir Boreas, as to which he professed himself to be in much doubt, because he had already enjoyed the usual leave of absence allowed by the rules of the office. But on this matter he found Aeolus to be very complacent. "'What, Italy?' said Sir Boreas. "'Very nice when you get there, I should say. But a bad time of year for travelling. Sudden business, eh? To go with your mother?' It is bad for a lady to go alone. How long? You don't know? Well, come back as soon as you can, that's all. You couldn't take Crocker with you, could you? For at this time Crocker had already got into further trouble in regard to imperfections of handwriting. He had been promised absolution as to some complaint made against him on condition that he could read a page of his own manuscript but he had altogether failed in the attempt. Roden didn't think that he could carry Crocker to Italy, but arranged his own affair without that impediment. But there was another matter which must be arranged also. It was now six weeks since he had walked with Lord Hampstead halfway back from Holloway to Hendon, and had been desired by his friend not to visit Lady Frances while she was staying at Hendon Hall. The reader may remember that he had absolutely refused to make any promise, and that there had consequently been some sharp words spoken between the two friends. There might, he had then said, arise an occasion on which he should find it impossible not to endeavor to see the girl he loved. But hitherto, though he had refused to submit himself to the demand made upon him, he had complied with its spirit. At this moment, as it seemed to him, a period had come in which it was essential to him that he should visit her. There had been no correspondence between them since those Königsgraf days in consequence of the resolutions which she herself had made. Now, as he often told himself, they were as completely separated as though each had determined never again to communicate with the other. Months had gone by since a word had passed between them. He was a man, patient, retentive, and by nature capable of enduring such a trouble without loud complaint, but he did remember from day to day how near they were to each other, and he did not fail to remind himself that he could hardly expect to find constancy in her unless he took some means of proving to her that he was constant himself. Thinking of all this, he determined that he would do his best to see her before he started for Italy. Should he fail to be received at Hendon Hall, then he would write. But he would go to the house and make his attempt. On the Thursday morning, the day on which Hampstead arrived at Trafford Park, he went down from London, and, knocking at the door, asked at once for Lady Frances. Lady Frances was at home, and alone. Alone altogether, having no companion with her in the house during her brother's absence. The servant who opened the door, the same who had admitted poor Crocker, and had understood how much his young mistress had been dismayed when the post-office clerk had been announced, was unwilling at once to show this other post-office clerk into the house, 
although he probably understood well the difference between the two comers. "'I'll go and see,' he said, leaving George Roden to sit or stand in the hall as he liked best. Then the man, with a sagacity which certainly did him credit, made a roundabout journey through the house, so that the lover stationed in the hall might not know that his mistress was to be reached merely by the opening of a single door. "'A gentleman in the hall?' said Lady Frances. "'Mr. Roden, my lady,' said the man. "'Show him in,' said Lady Frances, allowing herself just a moment for consideration, a moment so short that she trusted that no hesitation had been visible. And yet she had doubted much. She had been very clear in explaining to her brother that she had made no promise. She had never pledged herself to any one that she would deny herself to her lover, should he come to see her. She would not admit to herself that even her brother, even her father, had a right to demand from her such a pledge. But she knew what were her brother's wishes on this matter, and what were the reasons for them. She knew also how much she owed to him. But she too had suffered from that long silence. She had considered that a lover whom she never saw, and from whom she never heard, was almost as bad as no lover at all. She had beaten her feathers against her cage as she thought of this cruel separation. She had told herself of the short distance which separated Hendon from Holloway. She perhaps had reflected that, had the man been as true to her as she was to him, he would not have allowed himself to be deterred by the injunctions either of father or brother. Now, at any rate, when her lover was at the door, she could not turn him away. It had all to be thought of, but it was thought of so quickly that the order for her lover's admittance was given almost without a pause which could have been felt. Then, in half a minute, her lover was in the room with her. Need the chronicler of such scenes declare that they were in each other's arms before a word was spoken between them? The first word that was spoken came from her. Oh, George, how long it has been! It has been long to me. But at last you have come. Did you expect me sooner? Had you not agreed with Hampstead and your father that I was not to come? Never mind. You are here now. Poor papa, you know, is very ill. Perhaps I may have to go down there. John is there now. Is he so ill as that? John went last night. We do not quite know how ill he is. He does not write, and we doubt whether we get at the truth. I was very nearly going with him, and then, sir, you would not have seen me at all. Another month, another six months, another year would have made no difference in my assurance of your truth to me. That is a very pretty speech for you to make. Nor I think in yours for me. I am bound, of course, to be just as pretty as you are. But why have you come now? You shouldn't have come when John had left me all alone. I did not know that you were here alone. Or you would not have come, perhaps? But you should not have come. Why did you not ask before you came? Because I should have been refused. It would have been refused, would it not? Certainly it would. But as I wish to see you specially... Why specially? I have wanted to see you always. Every day has been a special want. It should have been so with you also, had you been as true as I am. There should have been no special times. But I am going. Going? Where are you going? Not for always. You are leaving Holloway, you mean? Or the post office? Then he explained to her that, as far as he knew, the journey would not be for long. He was not leaving his office, but had permission to absent himself for a time, so that he might travel with his mother as far as Milan. Nay, said he, laughing, why I am to do so I do not in the least know. My mother has some great Italian mystery, 
of which she has never yet revealed to me any of the circumstances. All I know is that I was born in Italy. You an Italian? I did not say that. There is an old saying that you need not be a horse because you were born in a stable. Nor do I quite know that I was born in Italy, though I feel sure of it. Of my father I have never known anything, except that he was certainly a bad husband to my mother. There are circumstances which do make me almost sure that I was born in Italy, but as my mother has been unwilling to talk to me of my earliest days, I have never chosen to ask her. Now I shall perhaps know it all. Of what else passed between them the reader need learn no details. To her the day was one of exceeding joy. A lover in China, or waging wars in Zululand, or elsewhere among the distant regions, is a misfortune. A lover ought to be at hand, ready at the moment, to be kissed or scolded, to wait upon you, or, so much sweeter still, to be waited upon, just as the occasion may serve. But the lover in China is better than one in the next street or the next parish, or only a few miles off by railway, whom you may not see. The heart recognizes the necessity occasioned by distance with a sweet softness of tender regrets, but is hardened by mutiny or crushed by despair in reference to stern parents or unsuitable pecuniary circumstances. Lady Frances had been enduring the sternness of parents, and had been unhappy. Now there had come a break. She had seen what he was like, and had heard his voice, and had been reassured by his vows, and had enjoyed the longed-for opportunity of repeating her own, Nothing, nothing, nothing can change me. How was he to be sure of that, while she had no opportunity of telling him that it was so? No time, nothing that papa can say, nothing that John can do will have any effect. As to Lady Kingsbury, of course, you know that she has thrown me off altogether. It was nothing to him, he said, who might have thrown her off. Having her promise, he could bide his time. Not but that he was impatient, but that he knew that when so much was to be given to him at last, it behoved him to endure all things rather than to be faint of heart. And so they parted. She, however, in spite of her joy, had a troubled spirit when he was gone. She had declared to her brother that she was bound by no promise as to seeing or not seeing her lover. But yet she was aware how much she owed to him, and that, though she had not promised, he had made a promise on her behalf to her father. But for that promise she would never have been allowed to be at Hendon Hall. Her brother had made all his arrangements so as to provide for her a home, in which she might be free from the annoyances inflicted upon her by her stepmother, but had done so almost with a provision that she should not see George Roden. She certainly had done nothing herself to infringe that stipulation, but George Roden had come, and she had seen him. She might have refused him admittance, no doubt, but then again she thought that it would have been impossible to do so. How could she have told the man to deny her, thus professing her indifference for him, in regard to whom she had so often declared that she was anxious that all the world should know that they were engaged to marry each other? It would have been impossible for her not to see him, and yet she felt that she had been treacherous to her brother, to whom she owed so much. One thing seemed to her to be absolutely necessary. She must write at once, and tell him what had occurred. Thinking of this, she sat down and wrote, so that she might dispatch her letter by that post. And what she wrote is here given. My dear John, I shall be so anxious to get news from Trafford, and to hear how you found papa. I cannot but think that, were he very ill, somebody would have let us know the truth. Though Mr. Greenwood is cross-grained and impertinent, he would hardly have kept us in the dark. Now I have a piece of news to tell you, which I hope will not make you very angry. 
It was not my doing, and I do not know how I could have helped it. Your friend George Roden called today and asked to see me. Of course I could have refused. He was in the hall when Richard announced him, and I suppose I could have sent out word to say that I was not at home. But I think you will feel that that was in truth impossible. How is one to tell a lie to a man when one feels towards him as I do about George? Or how could I even let the servants think that I would treat him so badly? Of course, everyone knows about it. I want everyone to know about it, so that it may be understood that I am not in the least ashamed of what I mean to do. And when you hear why he came, I do not think that you can be angry even with him. He has been called upon, for some reason, to go at once with his mother to Italy. They start for Milan tomorrow, and he does not at all know when he may return. He had to get leave at the post office, but that Sir Boreas, whom he talks about, seems to have been very good-natured about giving it. He asked him whether he would not take Mr. Crocker with him to Italy, but that, of course, was a joke. I suppose they do not like Mr. Crocker at the post office any better than you do. Why Mrs. Roden should have to go, he does not understand. All he knows is that there is some Italian secret which he will hear all about before he comes home. Now I really do think that you cannot be surprised that he should have come to see me when he is going to take such a journey as that. What should I have thought if I had heard that he had gone, without saying a word to me about it? Don't you think that that would have been most unnatural? I should have almost broken my heart when I heard that he had started. I do hope, therefore, that you will not be angry with either of us. But yet I feel that I may have brought you into trouble with Papa. I do not care in the least for Lady Kingsbury, who has no right to interfere in the matter at all. After her conduct, everything, I think, is over between us. But I shall be indeed sorry if Papa is vexed, and shall feel it very much if he says anything to you after all your great kindness to me. Your affectionate sister, Fanny. I have done one other thing today, said George Roden, when he was explaining to his mother on Thursday evening all the preparations he had made for their journey. What other thing? she asked, guessing accurately, however, the nature of the thing of which he was about to speak. I have seen Lady Frances Trafford. I thought it probable that you might endeavor to do so. I have done more than endeavor on this occasion. I went down to Hendon Hall and was shown into the drawing-room. I am sorry for Hampstead's sake, but it was impossible for me not to do so. Why sorry for his sake? she asked. Because he had pledged himself to his father that I should not do so. He clearly had no right to make such a pledge. I could not bind myself to an assurance by keeping which I might seem to show myself to be indifferent. A girl may bind herself by such a promise, but hardly a man. Had I made the promise, I almost think I must have broken it. I did not make it, and therefore I have no sin to confess. But I fear I shall have done him a mischief with his father. And what did she say, George? Oh, just the old story, mother. I suppose what she said was what I knew just as well before I went there. But yet it was necessary that I should hear what she had to say, and as necessary, I think, that she should hear me. Quite as necessary, I am sure, said his mother, kissing his forehead. End of section 35 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Section 36 of Marion Fay by Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 14 Mr. Greenwood's Feelings On that Wednesday night, Mr. Greenwood did not sleep much. It may be doubted whether he once closed his eyes in slumber. 
he had indeed been saved from the performance of an act which now seemed to him to be so terrible that he could hardly believe that he had in truth contemplated it but yet he knew he knew that it for some hours had been the purpose of his mind to do it he struggled to make himself believe that it had in truth been no more than a speculation that there had been no formed purpose that he had only amused himself by considering how he could do such a deed without detection if the deed were to be done he had simply been thinking over the blunders of others the blindness of men who had so bungled in their business as to have left easy traces for the eyes and intelligence of the world outside and had been assuring himself how much better he could manage if the necessity of such an operation were to come upon him that was all no doubt he hated lord hampstead and had cause to do so it was thus that he argued with himself but his hatred had surely not carried him to the intention of murder there could have been no question of real murder for why should he have troubled himself either with the danger or with the load which it would certainly have imposed on his conscience much as he hated lord hampstead it was no business of his it was that lady macbeth upstairs the mother of the darlings who had really thought of murder it was she who had spoken openly of her great desire that lord hampstead should cease to live had there been any real question of murder it would have been for her to meditate for her to think for her to plot surely not for him certainly certainly he had contemplated no such deed as that with the object of attaining for the comfort of his old age the enjoyment of the living of apple slocombe he told himself now that had he in truth committed such a crime had he carried out the plot which had formed itself in his brain only as a matter of speculation though he might not have been detected yet he would have been suspected and suspicion would have been as destructive to his hopes as detection of course all that had been clear enough to him throughout his machinations and therefore how could he really have intended it he had not intended it it had only been one of those castles in the air which the old build as well as the young which are no more than the airy fabrics of the brain it was thus he struggled to drive from his mind and from his eyes the phantom of the terrible deed but that he did not succeed was made evident to himself by the hot clammy drops of sweat which came out upon his brow by his wakefulness throughout the livelong night by the carefulness with which his ears watched for the sound of the young man's coming as though it were necessary that he should be made assured that the murder had in truth not been done before that hour had come he found himself to be shaking even in his bed to be drawing the clothes around him to dispel the icy cold though the sweat still stood upon his brow to be hiding his eyes under the bedclothes in order that he might not see something which seemed to be visible to him through the utter darkness of the chamber at any rate he had done nothing let his thoughts have been what they might he had soiled neither his hands nor his conscience though everything that he had ever done or ever thought were known he was free from all actual crime she had talked of death and thought of murder he had only echoed her words and her thoughts meaning nothing as a man is bound to do to a woman why then could he not sleep why should he be hot and shiver with cold by turns why should horrid phantoms perplex him in the dark he was sure he had never meant it what must be the agony of those who do mean of those who do execute if such punishment as this were awarded to one who had done no more than build a horrid castle in the air did she sleep he wondered she who had certainly done more than build a castle in the air 
she who had wished and longed, and had a reason for her wishing and her longing. At last he heard a footfall on the road, which passed but some few yards distant from his window. A quick, cheery, almost running footfall, a step full of youth and life, sounding crisp on the hard frozen ground, and he knew that the young man whom he hated had come. Though he had never thought of murdering him, as he told himself, yet he hated him. And then his thoughts, although in opposition to his own wishes, which were intent upon sleep, if sleep would only come to him, ran away to the building of other castles. How would it have been now, now at this moment, if that plan, which he had never really intended to carry out, which had only been a speculation, had been a true plan, and had been truly executed? How would it have been with them all now at Trafford Park? The Marchioness would have been, at any rate, altogether satisfied. But what comfort would there have been in that to him? Lord Frederick would have been the heir to a grand title and to vast estates. But how would he have been the better for that? The old lord who was lying there so sick in the next room might probably have sunk into his grave with a broken heart. The Marquis had of late been harsh to him, but there did come to him an idea at the present moment that he had for thirty years eaten the sick man's bread. And the young man would have been sent without a moment's notice to meet his final doom. Of what nature that might have been, the wretched man lying there did not dare even to make a picture in his imagination. It was a matter which he had sedulously and successfully dismissed from all his thoughts. It was of the body lying out there in the cold, not of the journey which the winged soul might make, that he unwillingly drew a picture to himself. He conceived how he himself, in the prosecution of the plan which he had formed, would have been forced to have awakened the house, and to tell of the deed, and to assist in carrying the body to what resting place might have been found for it. There he would have had to enact a part of which he had, a few hours since, told himself that he would be capable but in attempting which he was now sure that he would have succumbed to the difficulties of the struggle. Who would have broken the news to the father? Who would have attempted to speak the first word of vain consolation? Who would have flown to the lady's door upstairs and have informed her that death was in the house, and have given her to understand that the eldest of her darlings was the heir? it would have been for him to do it all, for him with a spirit weighed down to the ground by that terrible burden with which the doing of such a deed would have loaded it. He would certainly have revealed himself in the struggle. But why should he allow his mind to be perplexed with such thoughts? No such deed had been done. There had been no murder. The young man was there now in the house, light-hearted after his walk, full of life and youthful energy. Why should he be troubled with such waking dreams as these? Must it be so with him always, for the rest of his life, only because he had considered how a thing might best be done? He heard a footstep in a distant passage, and a door closed, and then again all was silent. Was there not cause to him for joy in the young man's presence? If his speculations had been wicked, was there not time to turn for repentance? For repentance, though there was so little for which repentance were needed. Nevertheless, the night was to him so long, and the misery connected with the Trafford name so great, that he told himself that he would quit the place as soon as possible he would take whatever money were offered to him and go. How would it have been with him, had he really done the deed, when he found himself unable to sleep in the house in which he would not quite admit to himself that he had even contemplated it? 
On the next morning his breakfast was brought to him in his own room, and he inquired from the servant after Lord Hampstead and his purposes. The servant thought that his lordship meant to remain on that day and the next. So he had heard Harris, the butler, say, his lordship was to see his father at eleven o'clock that morning. The household bulletin respecting the Marquis had that morning been rather more favorable than usual. The Marchioness had not yet been seen. The doctor would probably be there by twelve. This was the news which Mr. Greenwood got from the servant who waited upon him. Could he not escape from the house during the period that the young lord would be there, without seeing the young lord? The young lord was hateful to him, more hateful than ever. He would, if possible, get himself carried into Shrewsbury, and remain there on some excuse of visiting a friend, till the young lord should have returned to London. He could not tell himself why, but he felt that the sight of the young lord would be oppressive to him. But in this he was prevented by an intimation that was given to him early in the day, before he had made preparations for his going, that Lord Hampstead wished to see him, and would wait upon him in his own room. The Marquis had expressed himself grateful to his son for coming, but did not wish to detain him at Trafford. "'Of course it is very dull for you, and I think I am better.' "'I am so glad of that. But if you think that I am of any comfort to you, I shall be delighted to stay. I suppose Fanny would come down if I remain here.' Then the Marquis shook his head. Fanny, he thought, had better be away. "'The Marchioness and Fanny would not be happy in the house together.' unless, indeed, she has given up that young man. Hampstead could not say that she had given up the young man. I do hope she never sees him, said the Marquis. Then his son assured him that the two had never met since Fanny had gone to Hendon Hall. And he was rash enough to assure his father that there would be no such meeting while his sister was his guest. At that moment George Roden was standing in the drawing-room at Hendon Hall with Lady Frances in his arms. After that there arose a conversation between the father and son as to Mr. Greenwood. The Marquis was very desirous that the man who had become so objectionable to him should quit the house. "'The truth is,' said the Marquis, "'that it is he who makes all the mischief between me and your stepmother.' It is he that makes me ill. I have no comfort while he is here making plots against me. If they two had only known the plot which had been made. Hampstead thought it reasonable that the man should be sent away, if only because his presence was disagreeable. Why should a man be kept in the house simply to produce annoyance? But there must be the question of compensation. He did not think that one thousand pounds was sufficient. Then the Marquis was unusually difficult of persuasion in regard to money. Hampstead thought that an annuity of three hundred pounds a year should be settled on the poor clergyman. The Marquis would not hear of it. The man had not performed even the slight duties which had been required of him. The books had not even been catalogued. To bribe a man such as that by three hundred pounds a year for making himself disagreeable would be intolerable. The Marquis had never promised him anything. He ought to have saved his money. At last the father and son came to terms, and Hampstead sent to prepare a meeting with the chaplain. Mr. Greenwood was standing in the middle of the room when Lord Hampstead entered it, rubbing his fat hands together. Hampstead saw no difference in the man since their last meeting, but there was a difference. Mr. Greenwood's manner was at first more submissive, as though he were afraid of his visitor. But before the interview was over he had recovered his audacity. "'My father has wished me to see you,' said Hampstead. Mr. Greenwood went on rubbing his hands, still standing in the middle of the room." 
he seems to think it better that you should leave him. I don't know why he should think it better, but of course I will go if he bids me. Mr. Greenwood had quite made up his mind that it would be better for him also that he should go. There will be no good in going into that. I think we might as well sit down, Mr. Greenwood. They did sit down, the chaplain as usual perching himself on the edge of a chair. You have been here a great many years. A great many, Lord Hampstead, nearly all my life, before you were born, Lord Hampstead. Then, as he sat gazing, there came before his eyes the phantom of Lord Hampstead being carried into the house as a corpse, while he himself was struggling beneath a portion of the weight. Just so, and though the Marquis cannot admit that there is any claim upon him. No claim, Lord Hampstead? Certainly no claim. Yet he is quite willing to do something in acknowledgment of the long connection. His lordship thinks that an annuity of two hundred pounds a year— Mr. Greenwood shook his head, as though he would say that that certainly would not satisfy him. Hampstead had been eager to secure the full three hundred pounds for the wretched, useless man, but the Marquis had declared that he would not burden the estate with a charge so unnecessarily large. "'I say,' continued Hampstead, frowning, that his lordship has desired me to say that you shall receive during your life an annuity of two hundred pounds. It certainly was the fact that Lord Hampstead could frown when he was displeased, and that at such moments he would assume a look of aristocratic impatience which was at variance with his professed political theories. Mr. Greenwood again shook his head. I do not think that I need say anything farther continued the young lord. That is my father's decision. He presumes that you would prefer the annuity to the immediate payment of a thousand pounds. Here the shaking of the head became more violent. I have only in addition to ask you when it will suit you to leave Trafford Park. Lord Hampstead, when he had left his father, had determined to use his blandest manner in communicating these tidings to the chaplain. But Mr. Greenwood was odious to him. The way in which the man stood on the floor and rubbed his hands together and sat on the edge of his chair and shook his head without speaking a word were disgusting to him. If the man had declared boldly his own view of what was due to him, Hampstead would have endeavored to be gracious to him. As it was, he was anything but gracious, as he asked the chaplain to name the day on which he would be prepared to leave the house. "'You mean to say that I am to be turned out?' "'It is some months since you were told that my father no longer required your services. "'I am to be turned out, like a dog, after thirty years? "'I cannot contradict you when you say so.' but I must ask you to name a day. It is not as though the suggestion were now made to you for the first time. Mr. Greenwood got up from the edge of the chair and again stood in the middle of the room. Lord Hampstead felt himself constrained also to stand. Have you any answer to make to me? No, I have not, said the chaplain. You mean that you have not fixed upon a day? I shan't go with two hundred pounds a year, said the chaplain. It's unreasonable. It's brutal. Brutal? shouted Lord Hampstead. I shan't stir till I've seen the Marquis himself. It's out of the question that he should turn me out in this way. How am I to live upon two hundred pounds a year? I always understood that I was to have Apple Slocum. No such promise was ever made to you, said Lord Hampstead, very angrily. No hint of such a thing has ever been made except by yourself. I always understood it, said Mr. Greenwood, and I shall not leave this till I have had an opportunity of discussing the matter with the Marquis himself. I don't think the Marquis would ever have treated me in this way. Only for you, Lord Hampstead. This was intolerable. 
what was he to do with the abominable man? It would be very disagreeable, the task of turning him out while the Marquis was still so ill, and yet it was not to be endured that such a man should be allowed to hold his position in the house in opposition to the will of the owner. It was, he felt, beneath him to defend himself against the charge made, or even to defend his father. "'If you will not name a day, I must,' said the young lord. The man remained immovable on his seat, except that he continued to rub his hands. "'As I can get no answer, I shall have to instruct Mr. Roberts that you cannot be allowed to remain here after the last day of the month. If you have any feeling left to you, you will not impose upon us so unpleasant a duty while my father is ill.' With this he left the room, while Mr. Greenwood was still standing and rubbing his hands. Two hundred pounds a year! He had better go and take it. He was quite aware of that. But how was he to live upon two hundred pounds, he who had been bedded and boarded all his life at the expense of another man, and had also spent three hundred pounds? But at the moment this was not the thought uppermost in his mind. Would it not have been better that he should have carried out that project of his? Only that he had been merciful, this young lord would not have been able to scorn him and ill-treat him as he had done. There were no phantoms now. Now he thought that he could have carried his share of the corpse into the house without flinching. End of section 36 Recording by Arnold Banner Thurmond, North Carolina.